The date is July 2019, and rumors of a military buildup of Chinese forces across the strait from Taiwan begin to leak to the international press. As the 4th of July is celebrated here at home, thousands of miles away, Taiwan begins to move their command and control functions into hardened nuclear-proof underground facilities. F-16s and other strike aircraft are moved into mountain bases, and dummy missile batteries and anti-aircraft platforms are set up around the island of Taiwan. August rolls around, and by now it's clear to the world that China is indeed massing what looks like an invasion force on its side of the Taiwan Strait. Though the Chinese leader Xi Jinping reassures the world that he's only interested in a peaceful reunification of Taiwan and the mainland. The American military is put at DEFCON 3, which signals the Air Force to be ready to mobilize for a potential nuclear conflict in just 15 minutes. As September comes, the Chinese military has begun commandeering civilian ships in order to help move its one million man strong invasion force across the channel. The Chinese military lacks the amphibious capability to move more than a few thousand troops at a time, but in order to face 100,000 Taiwanese defenders and their two million reservists, the People's Liberation Army will need every available ship it can get its hands on, no matter how big or small. Across the strait, Taiwan has begun littering the only 13 beaches that an invasion force could be landed on with mines, razor wire, and other horrific surprises. The US Pacific Fleet is fully mobilized by now, and the United States is at DEFCON 2. All military leave is cancelled, and Marines board transports as they head for bases in Australia, Japan, and Guam. PACCOM's carrier groups disperse a thousand miles offshore from Taiwan, careful to make sure that they do not stray too deep into the net of ballistic missile coverage that China uses to threaten American naval vessels. There's no hiding China's intentions now. An invasion of Taiwan is coming, and the entire world knows it. Taiwanese troops, supplemented by a few thousand rapid response American forces, dig in for what will be the largest amphibious assault in history. The date is October 3rd, 2019. The seas between Taiwan and China are finally calm again, presenting a narrow four-week opportunity for an amphibious assault that only reoccurs briefly one other time of the year in May. Chinese troops are rushed to waiting transports. The lucky ones board military amphibious landing craft, while the unlucky ones must make the treacherous crossing on civilian boats with little if any protection. Overhead, hundreds of missiles fly out over the strait, slamming into radar, communications, and control nodes all over the island. Airfields are cratered. Civilian power plants are destroyed. Chinese jets scream overhead en route to strike at Taiwanese tanks and artillery pieces, shortly after followed by Chinese bombers. Yet the Taiwanese Air Force has long been redeployed to underground facilities, and American-made F-16s flown by Taiwanese pilots rise up to meet the incoming Chinese planes. A thousand miles away, U.S. carrier battle groups are given the green light to advance to forward positions just off the Taiwan coast, bringing a significant portion of America's naval air power. They alone are more than a match for the Chinese Air Force. Yet as they steam ahead, a rain of ballistic missiles falls upon the battle groups. Anti-missile defense systems intercept many, yet others manage to slip through and deal devastating blows against American supercarriers. In moments, thousands of American sailors are dead. And in the first five minutes of the war, more American servicemen have died than in all conflicts combined since Vietnam. By the end of the first month of fighting, American casualties will reach Vietnam War levels, with Chinese and Taiwanese casualties many times that number. By the end of 2019, the war will officially be the bloodiest conflict since World War II. But could such a war really happen? And if it did, could you actually be drafted to fight in it? The sad answer is yes. And in fact, American military planners consider the Taiwan-China situation to be one of the several flashpoints that would lead directly to a third world war. China, for its part, has long claimed that it seeks only a peaceful reunification with the island nation. Yet, just in 2016, Xi Jinping stated, We have the determination, the ability, and the preparedness to deal with Taiwanese independence. And if we do not deal with it, we will be overthrown. China views Taiwan's continued independence as more than the historical thorn in its side, but now rather as a direct threat to the mainland's continued communist leadership. This is because the island nation has only grown more prosperous and economically powerful over the decades, becoming the 19th largest economy in the world. Taiwan also directly employs many mainland Chinese citizens, either on the island itself or in off-site factories and offices run by Taiwanese businesses. The same cannot be said in large numbers of China's influence on Taiwan. Yet even more dangerous than Taiwan's prosperity is what Xi Jinping and Chinese leadership fear the most, 
It's liberal democracy. Taiwan's liberal democratic values completely undermined China's own hardline nationalistic values. While China enforces strict censorship, Taiwan espouses the same liberal values that America does, and mainland Chinese have begun to take notice. Pro-democracy demonstrations continue to grow within China, and as Chinese citizens spend more time abroad both in Taiwan and Europe and America, they are starting to bring democratic values back home with them. For China, Taiwan's continued independence is a deathly threat that must one day be eliminated and increasingly it looks like plans to eliminate Taiwan's independence are to do so by force. Yet if China were to launch a war against Taiwan, currently one of the likeliest conflicts that the US actively prepares for, then America would be treaty bound to defend the island democracy. This would pit the two largest economies and military powers in the world against each other. And while the US would inevitably come out slightly ahead of China, casualties on both sides would be staggering. To this end, America would immediately need to boost its active military forces. The first step in bolstering American forces would be an immediate call-up of all reservists. With 860,000 reservists, any draft notices would likely not come for a while. Yet, depending on the scale of the war and America's objectives, a draft may ultimately be inevitable. Currently, America has two objectives to achieve in any conflict with China. The first being the complete destruction of its air and naval forces, and the second being the toppling of its communist government. The total destruction of all Chinese naval and air forces are a non-negotiable objective, meaning that no matter how the war went, unless it somehow went extremely poorly for the US, there would be no negotiations for a ceasefire until this objective was met. The US would direct all of its efforts and resources at ensuring that no Chinese naval or air forces survive the conflict. And the reasoning is quite simple. China cannot hope to fight a second war if its navy and air force is destroyed, and a lengthy rearmament period would take a decade or more, giving ample opportunity for the US and allies to rearm themselves. The removal of China's communist government is an ancillary objective, which would be carried out via precision strikes, covert operations, and psychological operations aimed at the Chinese citizenry. Given that a purely military removal of China's government would require a full-scale land invasion, the US is happy to wage a war and not meet this objective, or leave it in the hands of a civilian population riled up by aggressive psychological operations. In the first scenario, it's unlikely that a draft would be instigated by the US government, given the US's advantages in naval and air forces both. Though both the American Navy and Air Force would suffer significant losses in the effort, China would indubitably face the complete annihilation of its own Navy and Air Force to the Americans and their allies. In this case, reservists would likely be enough to bring American combat strength back to manageable levels, and a draft would be highly unlikely. Yet if the scope of the conflict expanded for any reason, and a direct removal of China's communist government was the only road to peace, an American draft would be a necessity. With over 2 million active duty forces in the Chinese military, the US and its allies would need to bolster their own numbers significantly to even attempt an invasion of China. All male American citizens and immigrant non-citizens between the ages of 18 and 25 are required by law to register in the selective service system. In 2010, the SSS had over 16 million young American men on file, yet the US has a total fit-for-service manpower pool of over 111 million. With an increasingly bloody conflict against China, the SSS would without a doubt be activated, and full-rate conscription would begin for the first time since Vietnam. War with China is not likely, and yet it is considered the most realistic and probable flashpoint for the world's next major war. While the world has not seen any major powers go to war since the end of World War II, and it will hopefully not see them do so ever again, the reality is that several of any possible diplomatic missteps in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait could lead to an unavoidable conflict between the US and China. And with the life of the Chinese Communist Party likely dependent on forcing Taiwan back into the fold and crushing the island's democratic government, the US may be headed straight for another military draft sooner than any of us could have hoped for. This video was made possible by Wix. If you are ready to create a website, head over to wix.com slash go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. This is an all new kind of military comparison because we are not matching a pair of nations, but rather two against one.
According to Business Insider in 2018, this triumvirate of nations has the most powerful militaries in the entire world, putting the USA in first, Russia in second, and China in third. Following these three countries are India, France, and the UK. Now we already know that the USA spends more on its military than any other country, something not all Americans are very happy about, but we also know that Russia has had a powerful military for many years and that China has more recently started to spend big. So what would happen if they teamed up against the US? That's what we'll find out. In this episode of the Infographic Show, USA versus China and Russia, who would win? The USA spends more on defense than the next nine countries in total, which is some feat. When you look at the sources for the military base budget, most say it's somewhere between 587 billion and 597 billion. Nonetheless, the website The Balance goes a step further and adds the expenses of other agencies that come under the defense umbrella, and it states that the budget is actually 886 billion dollars. We can't itemize this bill, as it would take an entire show, but most of the money goes on the actual running of the military. However, and this is a huge part, the website states the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Program cost $400 billion for 2,457 planes, mostly for development and testing. Those F-35s sure are expensive, especially when you consider that the Department of Education got only $59 billion last year. What about China and Russia? As for Russia's budget, again it depends on what source you are reading. Fortune in 2017 called Russia's military leaner but meaner, stating that its budget had decreased to just $42.3 billion. Other sources say it's more like $46 billion. That isn't much compared to the USA, but we'll see how that money was spent soon. China's defense budget, and most sources agree, for 2018 is $174.5 billion. Okay, so the USA has the highest GDP in the world at $19.4 trillion, according to the International Monetary Fund. China was next at $12 trillion, and Russia was in 12th at $1.53 trillion. What we can say is that it's obvious why Russia is spending much less than the USA, but China, if it wanted to, could perhaps spend a little more. Percentage-wise, the USA spends a fair bit more than China on military when the budget is divided by GDP. Still, in terms of spending power, the USA is stronger than both countries, and in terms of military spending, it spends about four times more than both China and Russia combined. But what do we get for the money? One website dedicates its time to adding up how many people and how much machinery each country has. As for the USA, in terms of feet on the ground, it has a total of 2,083,100 personnel, 1,281,900 work as active personnel, and 801,200 are reserves. Here we can guess the USA will fall behind. Russia has a total of 3,586,128 military personnel, 1,013,628 are active personnel, and 2,572,500 are reserves. China has a total of 2,693,000 military personnel, 2,183,000 are active personnel, and 510,000 are reserves. What this means is that Russia and China together have about a three times larger military in terms of manpower than the USA. When it comes to people needed to fight, one thing to bear in mind is training, but when it comes to war, one of the things you have to think about is who would fight and sacrifice themselves. Perhaps the most war-torn nation is Russia, having suffered in the world wars so much. But then the US has been at war or secretly involved in military operations almost since the Second World War. China's military is largely untested, but one should ask if China's regime would be better able than the US government at summoning its people to fight. We might also ask if those many in the USA who have grown used to relatively more creature comforts would even join a war, or would they even protest against one? As we say, there's no easy way to understand this. We can only speculate. Let's now have a look at what each country has in terms of machines that travel on land. The USA has in total 5,884 battle tanks, 38,822 armored fighting vehicles, 950 self-propelled artillery, 795 towed artillery, and 1,197 rocket projectors. Russia has 20,300 battle tanks, 27,400 armored fighting vehicles, 5,970 self-propelled artillery, 4,466 towed artillery, and 3,816 rocket projectors. China has 7,760 16 battle tanks, 9,000 armored fighting vehicles, 2,000 self 
self-propelled artillery, 6,246 towed artillery, and 2,050 rocket projectors. As you can see, the USA has far fewer machines here, but it does have the M1 Abrams tank, which is regarded as one of the best in the world. Much of Russia's fleet is old, but its T90 is good, and its newer Armada super tank is also regarded as a mean machine and perhaps the best in the world. But as National Interest pointed out in 2018, the country may not have enough money to produce many of them. That's the big difference. The USA has tons of budget to produce many more tanks if need be. National Interest also points out that most of China's tank fleet is old, but hastens to say that China's Type 99 can hold its weight with any of Russia's or America's tanks. You have to give Russia and China the advantage here. But where the USA is strongest is in the air, with no other country coming near its outrageously powerful fleet of aircraft. We already know about all those F-35s in development, but the USA also has a large fleet of other great aircraft, including F-22 Raptors, F-15E Strike Eagles, F-A-18EF Super Hornets, and F-16 Fighting Falcons. This year, it bought 15 KC-46 tanker strategic military transport aircrafts for $3.1 billion, and also one B-21 bomber for $2 billion. We might also wonder what's going on with stealth aircraft at that secretive place called Area 51. Still, Russia has hundreds of Sukhoi Su-35s, and no one has ever doubted this aircraft is as good as any that exist. As backup, it has fleets of MiG-29s, Su-27s, and MiG-31s. Looking at the future and fifth-generation aircraft, Russia is quietly building the Sukhoi T-50 Pak-FA, which national interest said is as good as anything out there, while the airplane Russia calls the Ghost, the Su-57 stealth fighter, is currently under development. China is no slouch either, with its ready-for-battle Chengdu J-10s and J-20s. You'll find all of these aircraft we've mentioned on top 10 lists, with pundits not always agreeing on which takes first place. All we can say is that the US has more cash to build more, and perhaps a more experienced air force. As for the Navy, the US holds an ace in the hole with its large fleet of 20 strong aircraft carriers, expensive things but extremely important in war. The biggest and perhaps best of its kind is the USA's Gerald R. Ford, and the US also has two supercarriers under construction and 10 more planned, which will cost many billions of dollars. China has just two aircraft carriers, but is building a supercarrier called the Type 002. Russia has one fairly old aircraft carrier, not quite up to speed with China and America. The US also has 10 frigates, 65 destroyers, so more to come this year, zero corvettes, 66 submarines, 13 patrol craft, and 11 mine warfare vessels. China has 50 frigates, 29 destroyers, 39 corvettes, 73 submarines, 220 patrol craft, and 29 mine warfare vessels. Russia has 9 frigates, 13 destroyers, 78 corvettes, 62 submarines, 41 patrol craft, and 47 mine warfare vessels. Not surprisingly, if you look at any top 10 lists, the best navies in the world usually go something like 3rd Russia, 2nd China, and 1st USA. Only global firepower puts China ahead of the USA, but it's only adding up the number of vessels. Still, you can find articles on the web stating that China is catching up to the USA, so if we add Russia to China, well, that's a formidable force. We could talk about nuclear weapons, but we all know most of those are split between Russia and the USA. China has some, but no one knows how many exactly. We could also wonder if any country could prevent any missiles hitting in the event of a nuclear war, but it's likely it would just mean all-out destruction. So, in terms of who would win this hypothetical matchup, and let's say the USA didn't have any allies, such as its favorite big brother the UK, we'd have to say Russia and China. The USA may have the money, but both China and Russia are developing all kinds of new weapons to match any weapons in the US. On top of that, you just have so much more manpower. It would, in the end, overwhelm the USA. China and Japan are two countries that have been culturally intertwined from as early as 400 AD. This relationship led to Japan adopting the Chinese writing system, the religion of Buddhism, similar political systems, as well as developing in matters of food, fashion, law, and more under the influence of China. Although the countries are currently at peace, relations have remained somewhat tense over the last century. Today, we'll compare the two nations in a hypothetical military matchup in this episode of the infographic show, China vs. Japan. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. The USA has the world's highest GDP of around $18.5 trillion. It's followed by China with a nominal GDP of $11.8 trillion, and then Japan with a GDP of around $4.8 trillion. The European Union would take second place, but the EU is a combination of 28 states. While China has experienced economic prosperity in recent years, its per capita GDP ranks low, globally in 70th place, at around $8,000, with Japan's per capita GDP much higher at around $39,000.
There is certainly less money to go around in China as it has the world's largest population of 1.38 billion people compared to Japan's 126 plus million population. In terms of military spending, China ranks third behind Russia and the military-minded USA with a defense budget of around $147 billion, which is 2.1% of its GDP. Japan sits in seventh place on this list with a $43 billion defense budget, which is 0.9% of its GDP. It's also worth mentioning here that military pundits often state China spends much more on its military than the number that is reported, although China's finance minister denied this secrecy in 2017, saying, let me be very clear, there is no such thing as opacity in China's military spending. While Japan is regarded as being a military powerhouse, its number of military personnel is actually quite small and very much inferior to the number of personnel the Chinese employ. Japan has around 250,000 active military personnel, with another 57,900 people acting as reserve personnel. China, on the other hand, has a massive 2,335,000 active frontline personnel and 2,300,000 active reserve personnel and paramilitary forces. Japan's personal numbers may be small, but it's protected with some of the world's best military equipment. This includes 678 tanks, 2,850 armored fighting vehicles, 202 self-propelled guns, 500 towed artillery, and 99 multiple launch rocket systems. Its large fleet of land artillery includes two machines often on the list of the world's most advanced tanks, those being the Japanese-made Type 10 main battle tank and Type 90 main battle tank. China, however, outguns Japan considerably with a total of 9,150 tanks, 4,788 AFVs, 1,710 SPGs, 6,246 towed artillery, and 177 MLRSs. China's Type 99 main battle tank is also highly rated, while the country also claims to have developed the most advanced tank in the world in its VT-4. China is not alone in making such boastful claims, with the USA and Russia also stating they have the best tanks in the M1A2 Abrams and the T-14 Armada, respectively. The VT-4 is as much a Chinese war machine as it is a profitable export, with Thailand placing a big order of the tanks and other countries showing interest in buying. Both countries have strong air forces, with China owning around 2,900 plus aircraft and 206 attack helicopters. Japan has around 1,590 aircraft and 119 attack helicopters. In terms of strength, China's aerial piece de resistance is its new Chengdu J-20 stealth fighter, which the Air Force and some aviation experts have stated can match America's highly advanced Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor and F-35. China is also the only country to have bought the Russian Beasts of the Skies, the Sukhoi Su-35 multi-purpose fighter. If you've seen our shows on these aircraft, you'll know the Su-35 alone is an impeccable piece of engineering. Japan would be hard pushed to equal such aerial military might, but the country is no slouch when it comes to aircraft. Japan is said to have created a veritable equal to China's J-20, having joined the stealth leagues with its own Mitsubishi X-2. Japan has some formidable combat aircraft in its homemade Mitsubishi F-2, as well as American-made F-4 Phantom IIs and F-15 Eagles. The country is also the proud owner of the USA's highly touted F-35 Lightning II. Japan currently has one of these aircraft, but another 42 have been ordered. With this in mind, the two countries seem to be fairly evenly matched in terms of Air Force equipment, with Japanese imports being a major factor. As far as naval power is concerned, a matter of significance given the history of naval invasions and the fact that the countries are separated by a stretch of water, both countries are credited with having very strong navies, although most analysts rank China above Japan. The People's Liberation Army Navy is said to have grown from a fairly weak outfit consisting of old ships to a formidable foe due to massive injections of money since China's economic boom. The navy not only has well over 100,000 personnel, but has a large fleet of ships. This includes one aircraft carrier, 35 destroyers, 51 frigates, 35 corvettes, 31 mine warfare, 3 amphibious transports, 8 nuclear attack submarines, and around 50 conventional attack submarines. By comparison, the Japanese Navy consists of around 114 ships and 45,800 personnel, and according to nationalinterest.org, its fleet of 17 submarines is as good as any submarine fleet in the world. In total, Japan has three aircraft carriers, 43 destroyers, six coastal defense craft, zero frigates, zero corvettes, and 25 mine warfare. A matter of importance is each country's nuclear capabilities. Japan doesn't have any nuclear weapons, although it is protected by the United States under the nuclear umbrella. 
The country is well known for its highly advanced industries and technology, and there is no doubt that it could develop its own nuclear weapons given its nuclear energy infrastructure. This has so far not happened due to a non-nuclear weapons policy, although being positioned so close to North Korea, many Japanese politicians and military officials have called for a change in nuclear weapons policy. China, on the other hand, is one of nine nations with nuclear weapons with a considerable arsenal of around 260 warheads. Its first nuclear test was in 1964. The number of weapons, however, and China's development of nuclear weapons, has been a matter of wide speculation. For instance, a Georgetown University study claimed that China's nuclear weapons arsenal is not in the hundreds, but possibly 3,000. The study claimed the weapons were hidden in secret underground tunnels. The prospect of any kind of conflict involving these weapons of mass destruction, however, is highly unlikely. We cannot forget that almost every single tank, aircraft, or naval unit needs fuel to operate. China currently consumes approximately 12 million barrels of oil a day, but it only produces about 4 million barrels daily. That said, it does have 25 billion barrels in reserves. Japan, on the other hand, consumes 4.15 million barrels of oil a day, but it only produces a meager 3,900 barrels daily. Worse yet, it only has 44 million barrels of oil in reserves. The United States, the world's premier military power, China, a rising power that may one day be able to challenge the US's own, but today cannot. What if these two military giants went head to head though, and the conflict played out on China's own shores? What if the United States decided it needed to invade China? Could China defend from a US invasion? First though, is conflict between the two even probable? The short answer is yes, and the possibility is frighteningly real and seemingly only growing more realistic by the day. Today, these two great powers find themselves locked in what historians have come to term Thucydides' trap. Thucydides was an ancient Greek historian who commented on the rise of Athens and the fall of Sparta. For a long time, Sparta was the reigning power of the Greek world, until the city-state of Athens began to rival it in terms of economy, wealth, and military power. The end result was an inevitable war between the two city-states and their allies, as one side, Sparta, sought to hold on to its spot as the number one power and Athens sought to dislodge it. If you think that's ancient history, then consider that out of 16 instances in just the last 500 years alone of a rising power supplanting a pre-existing power, war broke out 12 out of 16 times. Clearly, the odds are not good that the US and China can avoid war. To make matters worse, the seeds of conflict between the two nations already exist in a variety of potential flashpoints. The biggest of these are Taiwan's continued independence and China's aggressive and illegal expansion into the South Pacific. Eventually, most likely due to the matter of Taiwan, a conflict between the US and China is likely, especially if China wants to prove it really is a great power. As long as the US Navy reigns supreme in the South Pacific, China cannot claim to be a great power and cannot influence its neighbors the way it wishes to. For China, conflict with the US is all but inevitable, not just a matter of national pride, but one of continued political survival for a communist party that finds itself increasingly isolated from the outside world by growing democratic movements along its borders. So what if the worst came to worse? Could the US successfully invade China? The US's greatest asset is the presence of its forces all around the world thanks to defense agreements with partners and allies. This is a mutually beneficial agreement as it provides a boost to the hosting nation's economy and ensures its continued defense in the case of a war. For the US though, it has the added benefit of allowing it to stage forces all around the world and quickly react to a conflict. American forces with their wide network of military installations and partnerships with nations all over the globe allow them a degree of flexibility and mobility that no other nation can even come close to matching. In a war against China, the US would rely on its Pacific bases to prosecute the conflict. Spurred on by China's growing aggressiveness against its neighbors in the South Pacific, President Obama launched a strategy of encirclement, much like that employed so successfully against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Today, this means that US forces are deployed or can deploy from bases in Japan, the Philippines, Guam, South Korea, Singapore, Australia, and even Thailand. Plotted on a map, this clearly shows how American military power is posed to contain China no matter in which direction it attempts to move its own military. The reverse is also true. The wide dispersion of US power in the South Pacific allows it to use military force against China from multiple avenues of approach, forcing Chinese defenses to spread out amongst a host of potential threat vectors. However, the primary purpose of US encirclement is not to start hostilities, but rather to respond to them or prevent them altogether. 
China's chief strategic problem is that it relies on overseas routes for most of its trade, with up to 60% of all Chinese trade passing through the South Pacific. Current U.S. force predisposition has the foot in the U.S. military poised straight on the jugular of Chinese trade, and it would not take much pressure to shut that trade off and send China into an economic collapse. In case of war, this is exactly what would happen. U.S. forces would immediately begin a naval and air blockade of all Chinese trade, boxing in the Chinese Navy all the way from the Malacca Straits to the Sea of Japan. While the Chinese Navy now for the first time in history outnumbers the US's own navy, it largely lacks a capability to operate far from its own shores and is best suited for coastal defense. This would make it impossible for China to send a naval expeditionary force to the Malacca Straits and secure them for its trade ships. Then there's the added complication of US allies and partners in the area who would indubitably join the US side in the conflict. Chinese ships trying to leave their territorial waters would find themselves threatened on all sides on top of having to deal with the formidable American Pacific Fleet. At the same time that the US ships are blocking off Chinese trade though, the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force would saturate US bases in Guam, South Korea, Japan, and possibly even the Philippines. These attacks would overwhelm American missile defenses and cause considerable damage, requiring weeks of repair to bring them back into operational status. This huge missile volley would greatly delay US offensive operations by both its air and naval fleets, not to mention the preparation of any sort of invasion force. However, it would also greatly anger the nations that host US forces, as missiles like the DF-21 ballistic missile have a margin of error that can be as much as several hundred meters. Missiles would be destroying not just US forces but also Japanese, South Korean, and Filipino military assets and even civilians. This would further cement support for US action against China. The Chinese missile stockpile numbers in the thousands, but it is ultimately finite and military facilities can always be repaired faster than missile stockpile can be replenished. Not to mention that long before a second volley can be fired, US forces would have moved to heavily damage China's command and control assets. In the opening of the war, American stealth bombers would strike at Chinese long-range surveillance radar, command and control nodes, and precision military systems deep inside the country. These attacks would be mirrored by a missile barrage nearly as large as China's own being launched by America's large submarine fleet most of which are capable of carrying long-range land attack cruise missiles. While China may be able to hold the US surface navy at bay with its rocket forces for a few weeks, possibly even a few months, the US submarine force would be impossible to target with those same rocket forces. And given China's extreme lack of anti-submarine warfare assets, the American silent service would all but have the run of China's coast. American stealth aircraft and submarine forces would continue striking deep into China, destroying air defense networks, satellite communication nodes, and other vital facilities for coordinating China's ability to threaten the American Navy. US stealth bomber losses would no doubt be very high, potentially knocking the entire fleet of 20 US B-2 bombers out of commission within the first few weeks. Air attacks would then have to rely on unmanned drones supplemented by submarine cruise missile strikes, but eventually Chinese defenses would be eroded enough to allow B-1 and even B-52 strategic bombers to begin to soften up Chinese coastal defenses. Going any further inland would likely be fatal for B-1 and B-52s, even at this stage of the war, with the Chinese Air Force suppressed but very much still capable. Escorting those non-stealthy bombers, however, would be American F-22 Raptors and F-35s, which would operate from repaired facilities in Japan and South Korea. While the US would suffer losses to both its F-22 and F-35 fleets, the loss ratio would be extremely favorable. After a few weeks of air operations, enough of China's air defenses and most of its formidable fighter aircraft would have been thinned out to allow non-stealthy US Air Force F-15s and Navy F-18s to join the fight considerably boosting the presence of American combat aircraft. American air forces are not just more capable than China's but considerably larger as well, with 13,264 total aircraft versus China's 3,210. Of those aircraft, the US operates nearly double as many combat aircraft as China, at 2,085 versus 1,232. To make matters worse for China, US aircraft are overwhelmingly more modern and capable, and its pilots more experienced. China may have the home field advantage, but the US would dominate the air and sea war within a few months, putting a stranglehold on China economically. In the real world, this is the limit of the US's plans for a war with China. Destroy its navy and air force and strangle it economically into submission. In today's scenario though, we're taking this a step further. 
Preparation for an invasion of China would take many months and require the mustering of most of the US's amphibious forces. If the US wanted to gather an invasion force and maintain its global commitments as they stand today, it would need to institute a national draft, which could potentially see it add up to 145 million additional personnel to its military. However, China's 1.3 billion strong population could muster up a defensive force of 753 million. Though with its much smaller military budget, a floundering economy due to the US's stranglehold on its trade, and damage on its infrastructure caused by American air and naval attacks, China would only realistically be able to train up and equip a small percentage of this number. Likewise, the US would only be able to equip a small percentage of its own reservists, leaving the numbers advantage firmly in Chinese hands. The US has always had the capability to move forces around in large numbers relatively fast, but in recent years it's greatly increased its expeditionary capabilities, adding a number of mobile landing platforms, afloat forward staging bases, and amphibious assault ships. Today, the US maintains three marine expeditionary forces, its primary force dedicated to kicking down the door on hostile beaches all over the world. Each force can bring to an enemy shore between 20,000 and 90,000 marines and sailors. These would quickly be supplemented by U.S. Army expeditionary forces, though they would require longer to assemble, prepare, and transport to a hostile Chinese beach. Initially, the American Marines would be forced to hold the beach alone, though they would not be able to land in their full numbers all at the same time. Not wishing to spread themselves too thin, and with U.S. air and naval power only capable of carving out a very small slice of safety on hostile Chinese beaches, U.S. forces may at best approach the numbers of the amphibious assault in Normandy, averaging between 15,000 and 20,000 personnel per day. This would require a full three and a half days for an entire Marine expeditionary force to make the beach. This would leave 20,000 Marines with the unenviable task of holding a narrow strip of beach against a People's Liberation Army of around 975,000, not counting reservists and conscripts. Even with air superiority achieved, US and Allied aircraft could not hope to hold at bay the vast number of Chinese ground troops, and it's likely that even before the first Marine Expeditionary Force could completely offload onto the beach, the Marines holding them would have been thrown back out into the ocean. Sheer numbers alone make an invasion of the Chinese mainland completely impossible for even the technologically superior US, and it would require the unloading of an entire Marine Expeditionary Force in one single landing to secure a foothold against the vast numbers of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. This is precisely why the United States has no plans of invading China, and instead plans on simply destroying the Chinese Navy and Air Force while blockading it economically in the case of war. A lot of important lessons have been learned from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Unfortunately for China, all these lessons may have put a real damper on their future plans. It's no secret that China wants Taiwan. They continuously claim the island isn't a sovereign nation but part of the People's Republic of China. The United States and much of the rest of the world, including Taiwan, disagree with China's claims. When Putin invaded Ukraine, the Western world and the United States in particular kept a close eye on China to ensure that Xi Jinping didn't have similar ambitions as Vladimir Putin. Now that we're a year into this war, it's highly unlikely that Xi Jinping would do something as stupid as waging a war against Taiwan. Currently, there's only one brutal authoritarian leader who's dumb enough to invade a neighbor, and it's not going great for him. That being said, China has been keeping a close eye on the events unfolding in Ukraine and globally, and with each day that passes, Chinese leadership sees any future plans of seizing Taiwan slowly slipping away. So let's dive right in. Why has Putin's invasion become a disaster for China's future plans? Let's look at each lesson learned from the war thus far and how they all spell bad news for China. The tactic China is currently using against Taiwan is called Gray Zone Operations. At a very basic level, Gray Zone Operations are non-military conflicts and confrontations by one nation, normally a more powerful one, against another nation. This tactic is used to weaken a country's resolve and hinder its ability to grow and create allies. But the key is none of the tactics cause military engagements or directly lead to war. China has been using this strategy in the Taiwan Strait for decades now, getting its name from the gray area between peace and a full-scale invasion. Along with gray zone operations, China is using another tactic against Taiwan called salami slicing. This is when a nation uses a series of many small actions to eventually achieve a much bigger outcome. The key here is that what the nation really wants to achieve is too difficult or illegal to do all at once, which is why it needs to be broken up into smaller steps. 
For example, China has slowly increased the number of times they've crossed into Taiwan's air defense identification zone until it's become the status quo. They next begin crossing the Taiwan Strait median line with aircraft and naval vessels. They've also been slowly deploying military forces on small islands and even creating artificial islands in the South China Sea. China continuously warns Western leaders against making close ties with Taiwan or visiting the island to restrict international diplomatic relations as well. And of course, China has used its economic might and influence in the region to put pressure on Taiwan's economy and politics. If these things all happened simultaneously, then the argument could be made that China was being too aggressive or preparing to seize control of Taiwan. However, these actions spread out over time allows the world to forget, while the culmination of gray zone tactics could eventually set the stage for China to officially incorporate the island nation into its territory. The crazy part is, this is all eerily similar to what Russia did just before invading Ukraine. Vladimir Putin used gray zone tactics in a variety of ways during his first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, and then again just before the full-scale invasion in February 2022. In 2014, when Russia sent in little green men, who were later discovered to be a band of mercenaries known as the Wagner Group, Putin claimed he had no idea who they were. This plausible deniability was a gray zone tactic, albeit one that comes very close to being a military conflict. But the use of gray zone techniques, along with Russian posturing and the West wanting to keep the Russo-Ukrainian war from escalating any further, allowed Russia to annex Crimea. It's important to note that although Russia was using gray zone operations, war eventually erupted, which is something that China has undoubtedly made note of. However, before this happened, the West responded to the aggressive gray zone operations by Russia in a measured manner. This is exactly what China expects the response to be in their gray zone tactics in the Taiwan Strait. They can continually harass and weaken Taiwan, and it's very unlikely the United States or anyone else will send military aid as they would not want to be seen as the aggressors. What China can expect is economic, political, and diplomatic pressure, which it has dealt with for decades and doesn't seem to be worried about. But now, here we are in the year 2023. Russia's in a brutal war with Ukraine, and China can only shake its head at the utter failure of its allies' invasion. When Russia switched from gray zone tactics to full-on invasion in 2022, China watched closely to see what NATO's response would be. This way, they could learn what to do and what not to do if they ever decided to invade Taiwan. We don't know, and probably will never know if China had any plans to invade the island nation in the near future, but if they did, Putin's failing war is likely acting as a deterrent for China to switch from its current gray zone strategy to a more aggressive approach. Let's look at how the world reacted to Russia's invasion of its neighbor and the lessons learned. Putin's invasion has been highly informative for the Chinese leadership. Unfortunately for them, the way the world reacted to Russia's invasion was likely not what they were hoping for. Lesson 1. China learned that size doesn't always matter. China has the largest navy in the world in terms of pure numbers. However, as China and everyone else has learned from the war in Ukraine, having a lot of equipment and soldiers does not necessarily mean you will win a war. One thing is glaringly obvious when China looks at its battle plans to invade Taiwan. They'll need to launch some type of amphibious assault onto the island if they hope to take it by force. When Russia rolled tanks and infantry into Ukraine, it was relatively easy due to the fact that the countries are right next to each other, and Ukraine doesn't really have natural defense features. For China, the Strait of Taiwan poses a huge logistical problem. It's generally agreed that an amphibious assault is much more difficult than a land-based one. In order to reach Taiwan, China's forces need to cross around 100 miles of water. That is 100 miles that Taiwan can unleash aircraft, missiles, and bombs to annihilate huge numbers of Chinese soldiers and vessels. Taiwan would fire artillery shells and anti-ship missiles to decimate the invasion force. When China looks back at how Ukraine was able to repel a massive land-based invasion, this probably gives them pause. Also, Russia lost the Moskva, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, in the early months of the war to what many suspect was a Ukrainian anti-ship missile, so it's clear that these projectiles would pose a huge threat to China's incoming invasion fleet. There's also the fact that Taiwan is an island, and its main defenses are designed to destroy naval vessels, which means they're likely to have a large stock pile of anti-ship missiles at their disposal. So China has learned from Russia's failure that their superior numbers might not be enough to invade and hold Taiwan. If Ukrainian resistance collapsed due to the sheer magnitude of Russia's invasion force, it would have been one thing. But that's not what happened, which is bad news for a Chinese invasion if they thought the Taiwanese people would just give up because China has a much bigger military. Lesson 2. Russian soldiers showed China that training makes all the difference. When analyzing why Russian troops are faring so badly in Ukraine, China must realize that Ukrainian troops are much better trained than their Russian counterparts. This, along with better communication and tactics by those in command, has allowed Ukraine's far inferior numbers to decimate Russian forces. Upon closer inspection, China and the rest of the world 
might find that many Ukrainian soldiers were trained through the United States National Guard State Partnership Program. Since 1993, the Ukrainian armed forces have been trained using the U.S. model of delivering mission-type orders and empowering Ukrainian soldiers to make in-the-moment decisions on the battlefield. The U.S. National Guard trainers use realistic combat exercises to help hone the skills and wartime decision-making of the Ukrainian military personnel. This has made an enormous difference in the war and allowed the Ukrainian military to be much more effective than the Russians. The bad news for China is that Taiwan joined this same program in 2022, which means every day that goes by, their military is receiving the best training in the world, which will only make an invasion of the island much more difficult in the future. Lesson 3. China has learned that just because nations are far away doesn't mean they'll stay out of the conflict. There's no doubt that China is the most powerful nation in East Asia. In fact, they're much more influential than Russia could ever hope to be in Eastern Europe. However, China knows from the war in Ukraine that Western nations half a planet away will still come to the aid of a country that they deem important. Ukraine is not a part of NATO, but NATO nations are sending billions of dollars in military equipment and aid. Case in point, the United States, which is on the other side of the Atlantic, has sent more military aid to Ukraine than any other country. What this means for China is that even though the U.S. is separated from Taiwan by the Pacific Ocean, it will almost certainly send military and humanitarian aid if China invades. Although the United States will likely do more than that, due to the fact that when President Joe Biden was asked if the United States would fight along Taiwan in a conflict, he gave a resounding yes. So by watching the United States send more aid than any other country to Ukraine, China saw their hopes for an ambivalent U.S. in a conflict with Taiwan become more of a dream than a realistic scenario. If the United States is willing to send billions of dollars, high-tech weapons, and state-of-the-art tanks to Ukraine to help them defeat Putin, there is little doubt they would offer the same type of assistance to Taiwan. The difference is that in a China-Taiwan conflict, the president has made it clear the U.S. would take a much more active role. Lesson 4. NATO has learned what works and what doesn't when a country like Russia or China threatens to invade. When Russia began mobilizing troops and sending its military toward Ukrainian borders, China watched what the response by the West would be. It's probable that, like the West, China knew what was coming next. The United States warned that the military exercises Russia was carrying out were just cover for an invasion, and Poland had been screaming at the rest of Europe to prepare for an imminent war for years. However, the response by the West during the weeks before the war broke out was what interested China the most. As more and more Russian troops were sent to the border, the West threatened to enact economic sanctions. China took note of this and likely was relieved at the response for their own future endeavors. Russia's plan, and a possible initial plan for China, was to invade, win the war quickly, and incorporate the vast resources and manpower of the invaded territory into their own economy. Yes, the sanctions would be painful at first, but once the war was over and Russia controlled Ukraine, a reduction in sanctions could be negotiated, and there would be an eventual boost to Russia's economy from the acquisition of Ukraine's territory. China would desire a similar outcome in Taiwan. Sure, there would be some repercussions from the initial invasion, but after swiftly taking Taiwan, they'd be able to negotiate the sanctions away. However, this is not what happened in Putin's war. Russian forces failed to capture Kyiv, and one year later, the war continues to rage, with Russia on the losing side. This is incredibly bad news for China for two reasons. The first is because they didn't get to see the scenario they'd hoped for play out, and therefore couldn't be sure how long the economic sanctions would last if they won a war with Taiwan. The second was that since the threat of sanctions didn't stop the invasion, and when the sanctions were enacted they didn't cause the economic turmoil the West had hoped for, it's possible that in any future conflict, the West's response to an invasion may be very different. Make no mistake, the economic sanctions put on Russia have slowly begun to cripple its economy and they will have long-lasting and very painful repercussions for the nation. However, they did not work as quickly as the West thought they would. Now NATO is believed to be taking a new approach. Rather than deterring a foreign aggressor through sanctions, they're moving toward deterrence through denial. This is a disaster for China, as they would much rather have taken on the sanctions than the second option. NATO now realizes that the threat of sanctions is not an adequate deterrent to stop a powerful nation from invading its neighbor, especially if there is a ruthless dictator at the helm. Their new plan seems to be to deploy troops to a region before things go too far to act as an additional deterrent against invasion. Let's take Taiwan, for instance. If intel suggests that China is mobilizing an invasion force, the United States and its allies might have just threatened economic sanctions in the past. However, due to Russia invading Ukraine, even when the West made this threat, the new plan could be to send NATO forces on a training mission, or create some type of joint task force made up of Taiwanese and U.S. soldiers. If China invaded and U.S. troops were caught in the crossfire, it could result in the West claiming China had attacked them, allowing NATO to enter the war on Taiwan's side.
This tactic could act as a more powerful deterrent than just threatening sanctions, as the last thing China wants to fight is a war they cannot win against the West. In Europe, deterrence by denial is currently being implemented by sending entire battalions of NATO troops to the borders between allied nations and Russia. This buildup of troops forces Putin to think twice before trying to expand Russian borders any further. The same would be true if the West built up its military numbers around Taiwan. If troops from any NATO country are stationed on the island or near it, China will need to think very carefully about its decision to invade. It would be all too easy for NATO forces to get caught in the crossfire and bring the rest of the alliance into the conflict. The viability of this tactic becomes a little murky since Taiwan is not part of NATO itself, but due to Russia's actions, it's unlikely the West would solely threaten economic sanctions against China to deter them from invading the island. Instead, China needs to now live with the reality that the West is willing to go much further to stop an invasion than it did with Ukraine. Lesson 5. Sanctions are slow, but they do work, and China is very much aware of this. When Russia invaded Ukraine, economic sanctions were enacted. G7 nations froze around $350 billion in Russian assets almost immediately. This surprised even Putin, as he didn't believe the West was willing to escalate things so quickly. However, it's now clear that even if economic sanctions don't work as a deterrent, they will still be used as punishment if China ever decides to invade Taiwan. As Russia is currently finding and China is closely observing, the sanctions will cause turmoil down the road. Russia can no longer get many of the parts and resources it needs to continue resupplying its military. Their monetary reserves are quickly running dry, and their economy is suffering more and more with each day as the war continues. The sanctions took close to a year to show results, but it's happening. China knows firsthand how crippling sanctions can be as Russia pleads with them for aid. It might make Chinese leadership wonder if invading Taiwan will be worth the economic consequences for the country if the Russian economy completely collapses. The world is a global economy, and although China plays a huge role in it, it still needs goods and resources from other nations, including the West. On top of that, one of the largest aspects of the Chinese economy is its ability to manufacture goods for foreign countries and sell them in foreign markets. Two of the largest markets for China are the United States and the European Union. If they were to enact sanctions and freeze buying Chinese goods because of an invasion of Taiwan, the Chinese economy could crumble much quicker than Russia's. By watching what's happening to the Russian economy, China knows that sanctions would mean a sharp decline in foreign investments, decreased availability of key technologies, and a decline in exports. If the sanctions were short-lived, China might be able to weather the storm. But every indication coming out of Russia is that the West is willing to sustain harsh sanctions even at a great cost to their own economies. It's just another disastrous lesson that China has learned from Putin's war in Ukraine. Lesson 6. The invasion of Ukraine and the ensuing conflict has caused NATO to keep a closer eye on authoritarian governments, especially China's. It was not clear just how far Putin was willing to go before the invasion. He did a lot of posturing and made a lot of threats, but it was nothing new for the Russian dictator. In the weeks leading up to the invasion, it became clear that Putin would go all the way. This was initially a shock for many leaders around the world, but learning from their mistakes, NATO likely won't be taking authoritarian threats as lightly anymore. This has set up a less than optimal scenario for China. The gray zone tactics it's been getting away with for decades now might be taken more seriously by the West, all because Vladimir Putin took things too far. If Putin had never invaded Ukraine, China might have been able to continue using its gray zone operations to weasel its way into having more leverage over Taiwan. However, now the West will be watching every move they make, which is the opposite of what China wants if it's planning to eventually take Taiwan. The invasion of Ukraine was also a wake-up call to the United States and the rest of NATO. Ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO has enjoyed being strong enough that it was highly unlikely anyone would threaten their interests. However, this false sense of security is part of the reason why Russia was able to mobilize forces and invade Ukraine. For too long, the United States was ambiguous about how far they were willing to go to protect certain nations. The US had the most powerful military in the world. There's no denying that it's the backbone of NATO. But if the United States needed to fight alone, it could defeat any other country due to its sheer size and capabilities of its military. Both Russia and China are unable to keep up with the modernization of their militaries in the same way the US does. This means that the US has an edge in any conflict. After the invasion of Ukraine, the US realized that other nations might have forgotten how powerful its military actually is. US leaders had assumed that it no longer needed to explicitly state which nations it was willing to support and send aid to. However, Vladimir Putin made it clear that he was willing to invade a country even if it did have close ties to the US. This has opened the eyes of the US government, and they're now taking a much more active approach of drawing red lines and making explicit statements about which part of the world they are not just willing to support but will fight for.
Unfortunately for China, the United States has made it clear that Taiwan is one of those places. If Putin hadn't invaded Ukraine, NATO might have continued to coast and allowed China to exert influence over Taiwan until its invasion plans came to fruition. Now there's very little chance the US will allow Chinese gray zone tactics to continue to the same extent as before. The US will most certainly be keeping a close eye on China from now on to ensure it doesn't mobilize any type of invasion force, and if it does, there will almost certainly be a military response by the US and its allies. Lesson 7. If an invasion goes wrong, power and influence go with it. If Russia had been able to quickly take Ukraine, dismantle its government, and incorporate its people into its territory, it would have been very bad news for the West. NATO and its allies would have needed to contend with the fact that Russia was a powerful adversary and that its military capabilities were as strong as Putin claimed it to be. But that's not what happened, and now the world knows that Russia is nowhere near as powerful as Putin made it out to be. An invasion is a great way to turn the world against you. A failed invasion is a great way to turn the world against you and lose any respect and power you once had. Putin's war has shown Russia's weaknesses. Even neutral nations have turned their backs on Russia and no longer fear Putin the same way they had before the invasion of Ukraine. Russia has been called out for its war crimes, lost control of the narrative they were trying to create, and allowed NATO to become more unified and emboldened. All of these things resulted from the failed invasion of Ukraine. China now has to wonder if the risk of invading Taiwan is worth the reward. The Chinese government desperately wants to control Taiwan, and even though it claims the island is part of its territory, the fact that Taiwan has its own government and does not answer to the authoritarian leaders of China paints a very different picture. If China were to launch an invasion to incorporate Taiwan under its control and fail, it could cause China's power and influence in East Asia to become greatly diminished. China's worked hard to make sure it's the most dominant country in its part of the world, and to be fair, they have succeeded. Nations like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan all have close ties to the West, but no matter who you are in East Asia, you rely on China in some form or another. If China invaded Taiwan and a drawn-out war commenced, it might cause their influence to decrease in the region while countries like Japan, South Korea, and Australia become more influential. Seeing this very scenario unfold in Russia might give China pause when planning for the future and what they should do with Taiwan. Lesson 8. Just because a country is a major power does not mean the world can't live without them. When Russia threatened to cut off energy supplies to Europe, there was panic. Russia sold a massive amount of natural gas to Northern Europe and controlled a large oil supply as well. When Western nations decided to reduce their purchasing of Russian fossil fuels and put a cap on how much they would spend, the Russian economy suffered. They continued to sell resources to other nations, such as India and China, but at a reduced price, lowering their profits. Needless to say, just because Russia controlled a huge amount of energy resources that Europe relied on didn't stop them from decreasing their dependence on Russia and finding other ways to fuel their homes, businesses, and infrastructure. This means that even though China controls a lot of resources in East Asia and provides goods globally, the world won't adjust or just do without them. China probably hoped to see the West cave in and give in to Russian demands, or at the very least, Europe would find they couldn't survive without Russian resources. But neither of those things happened. It would likely be a similar story with Chinese goods if they invaded Taiwan. Reducing reliance on China might be painful at first, and the global economy would certainly suffer, but it could be done. So why is Putin's invasion of Ukraine such a disaster for China? Because of the eight lessons we've just discussed. The failed invasion of Ukraine is a warning to China that the world is a different place than just a year ago. Everything China has learned, NATO has learned as well. Any mobilization by Chinese military to invade Taiwan would likely be met with much more resistance than Russia faced. The United States will probably be more aggressive in its response, and even though China is a powerful nation, it does not mean that they will be able to stand against the combined might of the West. If things had gone differently in Ukraine and Russia had been successful in the early days of the war, China might have looked at the invasion of Taiwan more optimistically. However, Putin's disastrous war is a bad omen for any plans China once had of taking Taiwan by force. All eyes are on the Russian bear as it marches across Eastern Europe. But is the bigger threat to the world hiding in the East? Is China actually plotting to take over the world? As a president famously said, that depends on your definition of is. There's no question that China is a massive world power. In fact, depending on your standards, it might be only the second superpower in the world after the United States. It's the most populous country in the world, with over four times the population of the US. It has the second largest economy of the world, the third largest country in size behind Russia and Canada, and is one of only a small number of nuclear powers in the world. It's certainly the biggest power in Asia, and it might have much bigger ambitions than that. But what are China's actual plans for the world? 
To find that out, you can look close to home. The province of Hong Kong, which was a British territory for decades, was handed back to China in 1997 after negotiations which created a plan of one country, two systems. Hong Kong would be allowed to maintain its autonomy and run itself as a democracy, while China would administer certain larger affairs and it would officially be part of the larger country. That was the system for a while, until China decided it wasn't anymore, and the People's Republic of China has been tightening the screws ever since, and China has been through plenty of changes itself. Since China became a communist country in 1949 under Mao Zedong, it's been a dictatorship, but Mao's strict adherence to the communist dogma, which led to brutal famines and repression, have long since been replaced with a very different system under Deng Xiaoping and the current leader Xi Jinping. The country kept its autocratic system of government while replacing its economic policies with a sort of hybrid government-controlled capitalism. Under this system, China's economy has exploded and has become one of the world's largest producers of electronics, appliances, and mined rare earth minerals essential for manufacturing. But in other ways, China's modernization did not bring good things. While China is only loosely a communist country now, their security state is still very similar to what it was under Mao, only with a high-tech twist. In the modern age, governments use the internet heavily to gain intelligence on potential threats. That's true in China and in most other countries, with powerful tech companies turning over information to the government as needed. In China, websites like TikTok contain extensive tracking software that the Chinese government uses for unknown purposes. And internally, China has become notorious for its social credit system. This ranks citizens based on their perceived loyalty to the government and their conduct in other ways, with various privileges being granted only to those with higher social credit scores. And if you're under China's thumb, there is little you can do to escape. Hong Kong was given guarantees of a certain level of autonomy for a specific term, but in recent years those guarantees have been largely overrun. While they still have separate elections, Chinese authorities increasingly interfere in them and disqualify or arrest candidates who oppose the People's Republic's policies. This often leads to largely unopposed elections, and the recent COVID shutdowns led to China getting even more directly involved and shutting down protests and public gatherings. So, if you're inside China, you're probably kept under a pretty tight grip. But what if you're outside it? That depends on where you are, because China has been involved in a territorial conflict near its borders for almost 70 years now. When the People's Republic of China took control, it was in the middle of a brutal civil war. The communists ultimately won, but the forces of the Republic of China managed to consolidate their forces on the island of Taiwan and hold it, essentially creating a new country there. The only problem is, China still refuses to recognize Taiwan as an independent country. In fact, while they claim they're the legitimate government of Taiwan, the Taiwanese government, now a democracy, still claims it's the rightful government of mainland China. But the People's Republic has much more power, and they've managed to use diplomatic pressure to prevent international recognition of Taiwan as a United Nations member state. And they're not afraid to punch back against big targets. China takes it as a personal offense when anyone recognizes Taiwan as being independent, even if that person isn't actually the head of a country. That's why most US politicians have avoided paying visits to Taiwan in the last few decades, to avoid causing any diplomatic crises for the president. But in 2022, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and some other members of Congress decided to make a visit to the island nation, and China responded hard. They stepped up military drills around the island, terrorizing the citizens, and one Chinese propagandist even said the country should shoot down Pelosi's plane. While clearly that would have started a hot war between China and the US, and cooler heads prevailed, it was clear China was willing to escalate in a hurry. But is China all talk and no action? That depends on where you look. While they get a lot of attention for their over-the-top online personality, with colorful propagandists spreading conspiracy theories and trying to meme, they actually do maintain a very strong deterrent against international criticism. And it's one Russia is fond of as well. China's justice system is notoriously harsh, with long sentences and the death penalty on the table for many crimes, far more than murder or treason. And while most of the people in Chinese prisons are Chinese, they have commonly arrested people from other countries for the purpose of prisoner exchanges. When the CEO of Chinese company Huawei was arrested in Canada, it wasn't long before a Canadian citizen was arrested in China on drug charges. But China's reach is growing fast. No one knows exactly what China's long-term plans are. The People's Republic has made many claims about invading Taiwan, and they're no doubt looking closely at Russia and Ukraine to see how that would go. But it's not going well for Russia. Most of the world has committed to supporting Ukraine with military and financial backing, and Russia has found itself increasingly isolated and sanctioned. 
While Taiwan isn't universally acknowledged as an independent country the same way Ukraine was, the United States has promised to defend it, so any sort of hot war on the island would likely escalate quickly with potential nuclear consequences. So China might be taking a slower, more global approach. China's internet efforts go far beyond an army of internet trolls, and they might just be becoming the world's most premier cyber hacking organization. While they're certainly not sharing the details of their operations, it's believed that they have three divisions of cyber warriors, specialized military forces that train in cyber attacks and work on behalf of the government, state workers who aren't in the military but are tasked with cyber warfare and spying, and a group of non-government workers who are likely hired by the government and have more deniability when they need to break into rival governments' networks. And they've caused a lot of damage. Who has China hacked? Who haven't they hacked? Countless countries have claimed that Chinese hackers have taken classified data. Australia claimed that a 2013 attack accessed the blueprints of their intelligence headquarters, while Canada reported in 2011 an attack compromised multiple federal departments. Japan has reported at least 200 cyber attacks on Japanese companies and scientific institutes, while China's frequent rival India reported multiple denial of service attacks that may have come from agents of the Chinese government. Ukraine reported attacks during the opening days of the war, maybe China acting on behalf of Russia, and even the Vatican reported hacking attacks. The US has been the top target of Chinese cyber attacks for a long time, with reports of attacks on military, government, commercial, and industrial organizations. Even the largest companies in the world aren't safe. Google was hacked in 2010 and reported that the privacy of its users was compromised. They also went after massive companies like military contractor Northrop Grumman and manufacturing giant Dow Chemical. An attack on Yahoo might have had less implications for national security, but they probably got a good look at your mom's emails, including that extended exchange with a Nigerian prince. So what does China actually want with all this data? Well, if you ask them, they'd say, we don't know what you're talking about. No cyber hacking here, as they proceed to hack another company. And because China refuses to fess up to its cyber hacking efforts, it's hard to say what they're actually after. While they hack private companies, it might be Chinese-style capitalism at work, stealing trade secrets so they can give them to their own companies, allowing them to produce lower-cost remakes of major US products, giving them a leg up in the market. They may also be looking for key access to diplomatic cables in their hacking of government institutions. But cybersecurity experts worry about a much bigger threat. If China knows how to get into the mainframes of major companies and government institutions, then they might be looking for a way to turn them off. And if they were ever to initiate war over Taiwan or another country, being able to kneecap the US's military and civilian infrastructure at exactly the right moment could give them the edge they need to finish the job. But is China actually planning a big move? If they are, they've been putting their pieces on the board for a long time. China has a long reach in Asia that goes far beyond Taiwan and Hong Kong. They unilaterally claim sovereignty over the entire South China Sea, which puts them into conflict with Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries. China's claim means that they have the authority to stop intelligence gathering activities by foreign militaries in the sea, which has led to multiple near misses between Chinese aircraft and those of other countries. The Hague ruled in favor of the Philippines during a recent dispute, and China's response was to reiterate its claims and continue its campaign of harassment. So why does China want this territory so much? Some people think it's just maximalism. After all, if you claim the sea surrounding a bunch of countries, it's really not a big reach to then claim those countries. But the ocean itself is incredibly valuable. With an estimated 11 billion barrels of untapped oil and almost 200 trillion cubic feet of natural gas hiding far below the waves, if China manages to get the world to accept their authority over these islands, they would have a huge leg up in energy production, something they very much need with their massive population and energy needs. This area also has multiple highly sought after fishing areas, which would give China the food it needs without having to rely on imports. And more importantly, they would control access to the food of many poorer countries who would have no choice but to align with them. And when you can't find a beachhead, why not make one? China has been known to take over small islands in the South China Sea, but they've started taking another approach, building artificial islands in the South China Sea that let them create unchallenged military staging grounds. These islands are typically built on rocks or reefs that are close to the surface of the water. After dredging the area to create a more solid floor, they're covered with harder material and turned into small military bases. This turns the disputed sea area into what's de facto Chinese territory, and serves as an act of intimidation against any other country that tries to set foot in the area. But is China a threat to the region? So far, China seems to be trying to win through soft power rather than open military action. They're hands down the biggest military power in the region, which means that any other country is likely to back down 
when directly challenged. While North Korea and India are also nuclear powers, North Korea is typically aligned with China, and India is preoccupied by its conflict with Pakistan. China's tensest relations in the region are with Vietnam, which it fought wars with previously. Now the two communist countries have hit rough waters, with China increasingly encroaching on Vietnam's coastline in the South China Sea while harassing Vietnamese ships. In 2014, China began building an oil rig deep within Vietnam's ocean territory. China seems to be making itself a regional power through sheer force of will, but elsewhere it's taking a very different approach. There's no continent more open to realignment than Africa. Historically, the subject of colonialism, occupation, and a brutal slave trade, many of its nations only gained independence in the 20th century, often at the conclusion of bloody wars. Now, while many of the countries do have good diplomatic relations with Europe and North America, there are naturally old wounds to heal. And that's why China sees the continent as a massive opportunity for expansion, but this time they're not looking to intimidate their way into a seat at the table, they're looking to buy their way in. Chinese investments in Africa have gained a lot of attention in recent years as the country moves many of its manufacturing efforts there. Africa is far away from China's expansionist actions in the South China Sea, and as such, many African countries are neutral to China. So when a Chinese firm shows up looking to build a factory there, they're likely to be approved. And China knows how to sweeten the deal. They'll frequently build new housing or other infrastructure as part of their investment, creating potential loyalists down the line should the world divide between China and the US. And for China, investing in Africa just makes sense. Many people see Africa as the future of the world. Not only is the population of the region expected to double in the next 30 years, the highest growth of any continent, but seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies are located there. That makes Africa the world's best place for future investments, and China has made it clear that they're not just restoring the old dynamic of Africa being used as a looting ground for world powers. They frequently staff their companies with African workers, providing jobs to the local economy, although they tend to be low-skill and low-paid jobs, while Chinese figures hold the higher positions. But is this good or bad for Africa? Some worry that China is setting Africa up for what's called a debt trap, where they invest heavily in a country in exchange for promises of repayment of the investment, only for the profits to never come and the country to be stuck in a state of limbo. That hasn't happened so far, as it doesn't seem like China simply wants to extract resources or money from Africa, they view it as a diplomatic investment as well. China wants to control the tech infrastructure in these countries, bringing industry to many of them for the first time. If China was to go to war with the United States and NATO, those countries would find themselves potentially cut off from a massive infrastructure network as China had commandeered it. One of the biggest concerns about this effort is that the heavy industrialization in African countries is hurting their environment, but the governments in most countries seem excited for the investment. But is there a longer plan at work here? China seems to have a hand in just about every region, similar to the other superpowers of the past and present. For Europe and North America, they mostly have cautious diplomacy and an aggressive cyber-hacking strategy to gain intelligence. For their neighbors in Asia, they approach with belligerence and flex their muscles to claim territory. But for nations in the so-called Third World, there's often an outstretched hand instead, offering heavy investments and possibly an alliance against the older powerhouses of the world. And some think this might be all coming together for China to make a big move. Many people have said the 21st century could be a Chinese century with the country's economy growing by leaps and bounds, but they've been hit hard by their efforts to contain the COVID-19 pandemic, leading to economic slowdowns. Additionally, they've lost many diplomatic allies in the West due to their aggressive military tactics and their domestic policies, particularly their internment of the massive Uyghur Muslim population and their treatment of other minority groups like Buddhists and the Falun Gong movement. That's kept their growth in check, with many Western countries becoming more hesitant to invest heavily there. Which then leads people to worry, are they biding their time for a military move? China is incredibly powerful militarily, maybe the second strongest military in the world. While Russia has the most nuclear weapons of any country, its weapons are old and unreliable to the point where no one knows how many would even fire. China is estimated to have only 350 nuclear weapons, a far smaller arsenal than the US, but every single one of them is in working order, and many are attached to powerful missiles that could hit just about anywhere in the world. They're also one of only a few countries to have aircraft carriers, and their naval and aerial fleets are believed to be competitive with the US's fleet. But their biggest weapon might be how prepared they are. So if China was planning to actually take over the world, how would they go about it? The first step would likely to be to plan with some other countries. China has become one of Russia's few remaining allies since the war with Ukraine, helping them get around sanctions and providing vital economic help. So if China wanted to make its own move on Taiwan, or a much bigger plan, it would likely pull in Russia for help. 
A coordinated attack on several targets might be much harder to coordinate, and they might have a third partner as well, North Korea, run by the infamous Kim Jong-un. Like China and Taiwan, North Korea has never accepted the independence of South Korea even after 70 years. A three-pronged attack like this might take the world by surprise. But would they actually win? In terms of a full military invasion, we've seen how Russia has performed and North Korea has never been tested against a military outside its peninsula. But China's naval fleet is fearsome, and many believe it could fight the US fleet to a standstill in the Pacific. And when you have two nuclear powers standing off shooting at each other, there's always the risk of escalation. China could not win a nuclear war with the US, but a major nuclear exchange would likely mean neither country is left standing. So China is hoping to avoid nuclear war, and it might have a plan to do so. Could China win a war without firing a shot? This might be where China's cyber hacking infrastructure comes into play. Unlike other military attacks, hackers don't announce themselves. They sneak in under the cover of darkness. Imagine if one morning America woke up and nothing was working. The internet was down, smart devices were malfunctioning, and even the government's connections weren't working. They spend hours getting things up and running, and tune into the news to find out that Chinese warships are shelling Taiwan. Their military has established beachheads in Vietnam and the Philippines, and North Korea has crossed the DMZ. While the fighting is far from over, China has declared their invasion successful, and says that any interference from the US would be an invasion of their territory. Surely the United States would arm up, right? Not so fast. Maybe China calls in its chips with Africa and cuts the US off from several key suppliers. Supply chain issues are a bane of Russia in the Ukraine war, and the United States might now face the same problem. China would have cut off its supplies, as will any country aligned with it. More critical and occupied Taiwan would no longer provide America with the key semiconductors it needs to operate much of its technology, and the United States would have to think twice before expanding key military technology. While South Korea's fearsome military would likely be able to hold off North Korea for a long time, and China would likely rein in the North to keep them from using nuclear weapons, it's unlikely that Taiwan or Southeast Asian nations could hold out too long without support. But is this where China would want to stop? Taking over much of Asia has been China's goal for a long time, and if this plan would work, it would have pulled it off without getting bogged down in a global conflict. This would firmly entrench it as a superpower and make the United States look toothless. More countries would be looking to align with China, and that includes India. China's goal would likely to be to turn India into a regional client state rather than actively trying to conquer it, and with Pakistan on one side and China on the other, they could put a lot of pressure on the subcontinent. Smaller nations in the region would likely choose to align with China for protection, and China's next big step would be to expand further out into the Pacific. Many small island nations there could be pressured into signing deals, giving the Chinese free reign in exchange for protection, and that might bring China into direct conflict with the United States. While most Pacific islands are independent nations by now, the United States has several territories including Guam and American Samoa. While they're unlikely to try to annex any of them outright, at least at this stage, they would likely start treating them in a similar way to the way they did Vietnam initially. They would just step on their sovereignty as much as they want and dare them to respond. Would the United States tolerate this? That depends on the political climate at the time. How much hunger does the US have for a conflict with a rival superpower? Does the public agree with defending these islands, or do they leave them to their fate? If they're left to their fate, that's another blow against the United States' standing in the world. And the next on the chopping block is Hawaii, an actual state but located thousands of miles away from the mainland. With a strong independence movement, could China make inroads there? So China's plan may not be to conquer the world in a shock and awe military campaign against the most powerful armies in the world, it might simply be planning to expand its power and influence piece by piece until it stands alone as the most powerful superpower in the world. It's late February earlier this year, and somewhere above the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea, a US Navy P-8 Poseidon aircraft is conducting routine surveillance of Chinese ships and installations along the group of remote reefs and man-made artificial islands. These islands have been built by China over the last two decades, as the nation lays claim to what it calls territorial waters, despite the fact that this territory is hundreds of miles from the Chinese coast and has been declared illegal by an international court ruling at The Hague. China, however, rejected the ruling and continued to build up its military presence on these faraway islands, reclaiming land from the ocean and building runways long enough to accommodate Chinese warplanes. 
radar and radar jamming installations, and missile batteries. With the international community rejecting China's illegal claim to the area, the United States has routinely engaged in surveillance and freedom of navigation exercises in order to delegitimize the Chinese claim and to keep tabs on the military developments in the area. Today, a Navy Poseidon spy plane is approaching one of these artificial islands when, from thousands of feet below it, a Chinese Navy destroyer suddenly targets the American plane. Using an extremely powerful military-grade laser, the destroyer aims straight at the cockpit, sending dazzling light into the aircraft and temporarily blinding the pilots. Undeterred, the US plane continues its mission, but for a brief moment the world hung on the edge of its next major war. This incident is incredibly not a rare case. As US ships and planes have pursued freedom of navigation exercises and intelligence gathering missions in the area, they've been routinely intercepted by Chinese ships and planes. But why is this going on, and how could it lead to World War III? Since 1947, China has laid claim to what it calls territorial waters within a nine-dash line created by the Chinese government at the time. This extends from the southern Chinese coast almost 1,000 miles all the way out to the coast of Borneo, and extends to Vietnam and the Philippines coast as well. The claim is not just illegal, but incredibly ludicrous. It would be like the United States claiming territorial waters, the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to Venezuela. China, however, is undeterred, and in the early 2000s began a campaign of island building by reclaiming land from the ocean and building upon pre-existing reefs. This was a first attempt to legitimize its claims, as no nation can claim water around an island feature unless that island can be proven to support human life. China's answer was to shortcut that clause in international maritime law by creating an island where one didn't exist and then setting up troop barracks and flying in supplies. Surrounded by neighbors much weaker than itself, while the island building actions were condemned, they weren't challenged militarily. The last time a nation had dared to stand up to China was in 1988, when Vietnamese forces were dispatched to drive away Chinese incursion into an island within their own economic exclusion zone. A confrontation between Vietnam and the Chinese led to China killing over 60 Vietnamese Marines and destroying three Vietnamese Navy ships. China officially occupied the reef and has held it ever since. A similar incident was in the making later in 1994 with the Philippines, but the Philippine government, remembering the killing of Vietnamese Marines and sailors by the Chinese, decided to back down and allow China to occupy features within its own territorial waters. But why does China want this massive amount of ocean territory even when it's so far from home? Well, that's because this area of the world is relatively underdeveloped by the gas and oil industry and is home to some of the world's largest energy reserves that are still relatively untapped rivaled only by the waters around the North Pole. The US Energy Information Agency estimates that there are around 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 11 billion barrels of oil in the area, with a 2012 US Geological Survey estimating that an additional 160 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 12 billion barrels of oil are still undiscovered. This equates to trillions of dollars in untapped wealth, and China is willing to go to any lengths to ensure it gets it. To add to the economic prize of the region, the area is also home to some of the world's largest remaining fisheries, and Chinese fishing vessels are already plundering the territorial waters of the nations that ring the South China Sea. These fishing vessels have used water cannons to force the fishing ships of other nations away, and with Chinese Navy warships never far away, so far nobody has bothered to fight back. Only the United States has the military might to challenge China's illegal claims, and it has done so repeatedly. Undertaking what is internationally known as freedom of navigation exercises, US ships and planes have routinely moved through the waters that the Chinese military claim as its own around the many artificial islands China has built in the region. Under normal international law, military warships of other nations must pass through the territorial water of a sovereign nation as quickly as possible through the most expedient route possible. The US, in a bid to delegitimize the claims by China, has instead opted to sail its ships in a zigzag pattern through the disputed waters, purposefully not sailing as expeditiously as possible, nor taking the most direct route possible. This places China in a difficult position as it can't legitimately claim national sovereignty when the warships of another nation flagrantly disregard that sovereignty. And unlike the small fleets of Vietnam, Borneo, Malaysia, the Philippines, or Burma, the US Navy isn't so easily bullied away by Chinese ships. 
Instead, China has been forced to respond with everything short of outright force, often shadowing U.S. ships with its own or intercepting U.S. Navy planes on approach to the illegal bases China has built in the region. While so far this hasn't led to a serious incident, thanks on the part by restraint exercised on both sides, this year's laser-flashing incident was indicative of China's willingness to push the issue with potentially catastrophic results. Had the U.S. pilots been physically looking in the direction of the laser flash, the high-powered beam could have permanently damaged the vision of the aviators, potentially putting the entire aircraft at risk. So what if the U.S. Navy had lost the entire crew of a P-8 Poseidon? For the U.S., that would have meant the death of at least nine American sailors, as each P-8 carries mission support crew including intelligence personnel handling many of the plane's extremely sensitive instruments. With U.S. ships in the region already on high alert around Chinese installation and ships, the loss of an entire aircraft to direct hostile action by China could have immediate consequences. In all likelihood, the U.S. would attempt to use restraint and authorize only a tit-for-tat response, likely targeting and destroying an expensive but unmanned and Chinese military installation along the disputed island chains. If instead the Navy P-8 had been shot down by actual Chinese weapons, and not just accidentally downed by blinding the pilots, the response would be far different. The U.S. faces a very serious choice. If it refuses to take retributive action, then it threatens to at last fully legitimize Chinese claims to the area, not to mention lose major international face as it essentially bows to China as the superior Pacific power. This is… Well, unlikely, to say the least, and an actual shootdown of a U.S. plane by Chinese forces would likely lead to an overwhelming military response. That response, however, would be limited to the specific installation the attack originated from in a bid to allow China the option of not escalating the conflict into all-out war. China would have to accept the loss of what would likely be several missile batteries and a radar and communication station, along with the men manning those resources, or it could choose to escalate the conflict. Escalation would be unlikely, however, as, simply put, the U.S. is by far the superior power in the Pacific. While China can threaten U.S. forces with a large stockpile of ballistic missiles, its navy is simply no match for the firepower of the U.S. Navy, and most importantly, China has not yet demonstrated that it has the ability to keep its targeting networks for its ballistic missile forces operational past first contact with American forces. Even if, somehow, China's ballistic missile kill chain remains intact, an extremely dubious proposition, its total stockpile is limited, and once those missiles run out, it will be up to the Chinese Navy to fend off the U.S. Pacific forces, which would by then be bolstered by ships from the Atlantic fleet. This is a task it is simply not equipped to undertake. Further complicating problems for China is the U.S.'s vast fleet of submarines, an asset that is routinely overlooked by military planners on both sides, and that's something that the U.S.'s silent service, as it's known, is more than happy with. With an extremely limited anti-submarine warfare capability, China's navy would be decimated by this undersea fleet, and with the vast majority of its trade coming through the ocean, an economic blockade of China would lead to a catastrophic consequence for the nation. In the end, it's in the best interest of both sides that no such conflict takes place. While the U.S. would doubtlessly emerge victorious, it would be a costly victory with the greatest losses the Navy will have endured since World War II. With China as its greatest trading partner, the U.S. economy would take a huge hit as well. Though unlike China, the U.S. could redirect much commerce elsewhere. Still, a fully armed confrontation between the two nations would have dire consequences for the world, and is not a proposition either side wants to see. And yet, China continues to build upon and expand on what detractors have taken to calling landlocked aircraft carriers in the South China Sea, unwilling to obey international law and continuing to bully its neighbors. This leaves not just the fate of the South Pacific, but the very peace and stability it currently enjoys hanging in the balance, and this time, it's China whose actions will determine what the history books say about war in the 21st century. If this scenario seems far-fetched, Perhaps it's not as far off as one might think, as an armed confrontation very nearly occurred between the U.S. and China back in 2001. On April 1st of that year, a U.S. Navy reconnaissance aircraft was operating near yet another disputed Chinese encampment, this time on the Parcel Islands, when it was intercepted by two Chinese J-8 fighters. In a bid to intimidate the Americans, one of the J-8 pilots undertook two high-speed flybys of the big U.S. plane, but on the third attempt, the pilot completely misjudged his skills and rammed straight into the American EP-3E. The impact split the J-8 into two pieces and severely damaged the American plane, which was sent to an uncontrolled dive. 
Incredibly, the American pilot was able to recover the aircraft, and severely damaged, it immediately sent a distress signal to a nearby Chinese airfield. The Chinese ignored 15 distress calls, and finally, the American plane simply decided to land on the Chinese runway regardless of permission or not, as the pilot did not believe he could keep the plane aloft any longer. The only casualties of the incident was the Chinese pilot, who was likely crushed to death on impact and unable to eject. Immediately after the incident, and despite the US releasing flight data from the onboard recorder, China claimed that it was the US plane that caused the collision by purposefully turning into the passing Chinese plane. This claim was in short ludicrous, and largely ignored by the international community, especially since China never released the flight data from its own aircraft black box. Things in the South China Sea remain tense, and a major incident between the two nations is only one provocation away. What happens next is largely in China's hands, but one thing is for sure, it is unlikely to back down from its claims in the South China Sea, and sadly, conflict seems likely. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, most of the world's attention is on Eastern Europe and a potential confrontation between Russia and America. However, for those in the know, the real cause for concern is China's reaction to Russia's invasion. Rather than joining the world in condemning Russia, China has joined India in sidelining the seriousness of the invasion. Even worse, China now supports and helps spread Kremlin propaganda, suppressing the atrocities committed by Russia on Ukrainian civilians. Why is China so interested in helping Russia weather the global storm it unleashed? Because China has plans to launch its own invasion, and that puts it on a collision course with the United States of America. Not long ago, China's President Xi Jinping stated that China must reunite the breakaway island of Taiwan with the mainland. After World War II, Chinese nationalists continued their war against rebel communist forces, inevitably losing and being forced to flee the mainland for the island of Taiwan. In the years since, Taiwan has flourished into a vibrant democracy and a major global economy, but China refuses to acknowledge its independence and threatens military action and economic punishment against anyone who does. The problem with what would be an otherwise internal security matter for the Chinese is that the US has vowed to defend the fellow democracy against Chinese aggression. But why does China want Taiwan so bad? The reasons are numerous, but chief amongst them is because Taiwan represents a critical strategic vulnerability to China. Currently, China is hemmed in by what's known as the First Island Chain. This includes Taiwan, the Northern Philippines, Borneo, Japan, and the Ryukyu Islands. Originally, the United States used the First Island Chain as a strategy to hem in the Soviet Union and its allies during the Cold War and deny them access to the Pacific in case of a war. To that end, it established strong relationships with all First Island Chain nations and partnerships that continue to this day. Now the Cold War is over, but a new Cold War has dawned, and China is America's new rival. With pro-US forces all along the First Island Chain, China will never be able to be a true global power, as its navy is too vulnerable to attack. Taking Taiwan will break the island chain in two, and give China an island fortress from which to project power deep into the Pacific. But Taiwan is itself a critical threat to China's continued existence, or at least its continued existence under the dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. As a democratic state, Taiwan is an example to all of China of a different, better way of life, and many young Chinese people who are being increasingly exposed to foreign culture are growing tired of the oppressive rule of the CCP. For them, Taiwan is a beacon of hope for what China could look like rather than the nation of strict censorship, government intimidation, and very limited freedom that exists today. Despite erecting the Great Firewall in order to try and limit China's access to uncensored information, the influence from outside of China still reaches many of the country's citizens. This is a dire threat to the CCP, and thus neutralizing Taiwan and bringing it into the fold is but one step into ensuring its own survival. Next, it must topple the United States as the head of the global order so it can export its brand of authoritarianism around the globe. If it can control global culture, it doesn't need to fear rebellion within its own borders. Taking Taiwan is a strategic necessity if China is going to be able to challenge the influence of the US. If China is going to rise as the dominant superpower or even just one that can compete with the United States, it must also be able to control the South Pacific. Currently, the United States Navy operates with impunity across the Pacific, and this puts critical Chinese trade routes in serious risk in case of war against the US. China imports the majority of its oil and relies on exports for much of its trade. If the US were to cut this lifeline off, China's economy would shrink significantly. Taking Taiwan and throwing the US out of the South Pacific thus ensures the safety and security of its trade, and removes the dagger the US currently holds to China's throat in case of a war.
But how exactly is China going to take on the world's most powerful military? Is it truly capable of challenging the US? And what do the numbers say? China's strategy to dethrone the US is to dominate what has come to be called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The First Industrial Revolution was the use of steam power to mechanize production, allowing for never-before-seen productivity and efficiency. Not long after came the Second Industrial Revolution, heralded by cheap and abundant electricity, which allowed mass production on an epic scale. The Third Industrial Revolution introduced advanced electronics and information technology to automate production, and now we're building on this revolution for what will become known as the Fourth Industrial Revolution. This new revolution will be a digital revolution, with billions of people connected electronically and breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, quantum computing, and other fields. Much like the first factory to install a steam engine couldn't picture what the world would look like just 10 years from then, it's hard for us to predict what life will look like in the wake of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, though it is going to be the most revolutionary change in the affairs of human history. However, China is picturing the Fourth Industrial Revolution as the key to global hegemony, and it's investing billions into ensuring that it is the dominant power in the new world to come. China's strategy to dominate the world in the coming decades is a fusion of civilian and military application of technology. First, it's striving to be a leader in the technology department, ensuring that it is the first to create revolutionary technologies, thus enriching itself financially and creating dependency from the world on Chinese goods and services. Secondly, China is seeking to quickly turn new technological breakthroughs into usable military technologies that will allow it to surpass and dominate the US. China envisions future technologies as increasing the speed of future warfare, with future military success reliant on having forces that are mechanized, informatized, and intelligentized. According to the 2021 DoD's China Military Power Report, what this means is that China understands that victory is only possible with fully mechanized forces capable of being quickly moved into a conflict zone and supported with heavy firepower. However, those forces must also have access to a wealth of information via disseminated sensor systems, with this information shepherded through artificial intelligence that can give battlefield commanders exactly the information they need at the moment, while temporarily ignoring what they don't. Warfighters don't just need information, they need help sorting through it quickly, utilizing what's presently useful. If this sounds familiar to any of our viewers, it's because this is exactly the requirements the US military was investigating just a few years ago. China's Academy of Military Science has now established a mandate that the People's Liberation Army's warfighting theory and doctrine fully capitalize on disruptive technologies like AI and autonomous systems. Much like the US did in the first Cold War, China's focus is on building a modern state-of-the-art force. But today's force must be capable of accessing vast amounts of information and supported by AI that can execute automated tasks and assist with decision making. China wants to teach machines how to wage war, so they can advise commanders in the thick of battle. Currently, the Chinese military is not very well networked, but those capabilities are increasing every year. It was only a few years ago that China first established a combined arms operations capability by establishing joint chains of command between its services in the same style as the United States. Now it seeks to match the US's networked capabilities by 2027 and then exceed them shortly after. But why is networking so important? Well, for one, it's what makes the US military so immediately lethal to opponents. Having the ability to network together ground, sea, air, and space assets allows for the swift exchange of information and gives a fighting force incredible adaptability and initiative on the battlefield. For an example of what happens when a modern force is not networked, all one has to do is look at the terrible losses being suffered by the Russians against a nation of fraction their size and capability. In the 21st century, the Russian military is still fighting battles like it was World War II, and the Ukrainians are making them suffer for it. In order to become a global leader in defense technology, China is taking a page straight out of the US's book by pursuing a strategy of civil-military fusion. What made the United States the superior power during the first Cold War was the close partnership between its military and civilian industry, which thrived in an environment of innovation. Such a partnership allowed for a swift adaptation of civilian technological breakthroughs into military assets and vice versa. With the US military technology breakthroughs quickly adapted into civilian technologies, making US companies the most competitive in the world. Artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, and biotechnology will shape not just the future of warfare but of human society itself.
Achieving technological superiority and leadership in one or more of these areas will make China a true competitor to the United States. Achieving hegemony over all these critical areas will make China an insurmountable superpower. In order to achieve the goal, China is investing heavily in domestic innovation, but also in foreign investment to acquire technology, the recruitment of global talent, academic collaboration for research and development, and finally, China's strong point, military and industrial espionage. So how is the US preparing for this looming confrontation? First, as scary as China's ascension may seem, it's important to remember that it's still running uphill against America. Since the end of the first Cold War, the United States has influenced a new global order based on growing liberal democratic values. As we've seen in the global backlash against Russia, the new world order frowns on the autocracies and abuses of the old world. Vladimir Putin is a relic of the old world with no place in modern society, and with a unified voice the West has shouted him and his nation down, even going so far as to severely hurt themselves financially in order to punish Russian military aggression. This should be of grave concern to China's Xi Jinping and his Chinese Communist Party, as they too are relics of the old world. The uprisings in Hong Kong that lasted for months are but a taste of the simmering tension just under the surface of Chinese society, and proof to the CCP of the corrupting influence of liberal Western values. Should China follow in Russia's footsteps and engage the world in hostility, it too will quickly find itself a pariah and outcast nation, effectively crippling any bid to become a global leader. This is why it's important for China to undermine Western values. The United States remains the world leader in technological innovation, despite mounting pressure from China and beyond. But the US is far ahead in one important area of technology, its ability to rapidly commercialize new and emerging technology on global markets. While Chinese technology grows in influence around the world, American companies are already globally established brands. China's modern problem is in convincing the world to buy more than just cheap manufactured goods from it. US commercial success is also due to its global culture domination. American brands are present in every country on Earth, but so is its culture. With one of the most rapidly evolving cultures in the world, US culture can be hard to define or nail down, but cultural export instruments such as Hollywood and Silicon Valley remain unassailable by their Chinese counterparts. For instance, while China may have developed the massively popular TikTok app, it wasn't until China pushed the app on the American marketplace and established relationships with American influencers that the app exploded in popularity. This is important because military and economic might only count for so much, and the US has used culture to bridge ideological gaps with partner nations around the world. Shared culture is the bedrock of strong strategic partnerships, and China has absolutely nothing of the like except for its partnership with North Korea. Shared culture and shared values are the reason the US remains the leader of the free world, and not because of its military being the strongest. Culture is another problem for China in its ongoing confrontation against the US and the rest of the West, because one of China's biggest problems is creating immigrant Chinese citizens. While over a million Chinese Americans reside in America, only a few thousand American Chinese have made their home in China. If China seeks to dominate future technologies by recruiting promising talent from around the world, it must be able to entice them, not just financially, but also with a desire to make China their new home. This is a massive problem for China versus the US, which remains one of the most attractive destinations for the world's most talented, due to not just economic opportunity, but its liberal democratic values. Finally, China must not just triumph over the US in future competition, but against the world, because outdoing the United States in one or more areas of technological innovation means little due to wide-reaching US alliances and partnerships. For America, a win by one of its allies is still a win for the US, while China must stand against the world completely alone. But how do the numbers stand today? What if a conflict broke out tomorrow between the two military heavyweights? Currently, the US is ranked as the world's number one military power, with China in the number three spot. However, this is debatable as given Russia's extremely poor performance in Ukraine, we expect that China will climb to the number two spot by next year. Dethroning Russia, whom it seems derives most of its power from its ability to threaten with nuclear weapons. However, poor Russian performance should deeply concern China, because just like Russia, the Chinese military is also completely untested against modern capable foes. While Russian forces were more than adequate to crush uprisings in Aleppo and Chechnya, Russian superiority in numbers with equipment meant very little when it went up against Ukraine's Western-trained military, with China's last war being in Vietnam in the 70s, a conflict it ended up losing, China should be extremely concerned about facing the United States in battle, whom, unlike China, is thoroughly tested in modern combat. Much like Russia, China has lacked a robust training regimen for its military, 
with exercises typically being highly scripted and mostly for the benefit of visiting dignitaries. This culture has begun to change within China, but the nation is yet to match the robust training schedule of the US military. Realistic training though is not enough for the Chinese military, as it, also like Russia, must also contend with a legacy of corruption that has plagued its ranks for decades. President Xi Jinping's massive anti-corruption effort has produced great results, but the service must still contend with many officers who hold rank due to the time-honored Chinese tradition of gifting, wherein a junior official gifts a senior official in exchange for promotion. Currently, the Chinese military numbers at 2 million strong, dwarfing the US military in its 1.39 million strong force. This gives China a numbers advantage, but the US retains a great deal of force multipliers that don't just even the playing field but tip it decisively in its favor. Chief amongst these is a well-trained and well-equipped modern fighting force, while Chinese units vary widely in modernity. A hefty investment in precision weaponry, integrated forces, and superior sensor and tracking technologies make the US a lethal adversary even against a numerically superior foe. Reserves will play a critical role in any Sino-American conflict, but both sides are nearly evenly matched, with China having 510,000 ready reservists versus the US's 442,000. American reservists receive continual training of one weekend a month and two weeks out of the year, while training for Chinese reservists is improving but still spotty. This provides the US with a smaller reservist pool, but one that is more quickly capable of being introduced into the fight, while Chinese reservists require longer training periods or risk being thrown into combat completely unprepared. The American defense budget dwarfs China's at $770 billion versus China's $250 billion, but that's not telling the whole story. First, the US budget includes many costs for operations that would have nothing to do in case of war with China, such as funding for its 11 unified combatant commands spread out across the world. These combatant commands are responsible for general peacekeeping, and their presence is a globally stabilizing force. Without them, local conflicts would quickly sprout and spiral out of control. For example, without US Central Command, Iran would quickly seek to neutralize regional adversaries such as Saudi Arabia, causing massive global disruption of oil and other trade that passes through the region. Also, China does not count all of its military investments within its published budget report, cleverly hiding them within other non-military budgets. A large part of its nuclear modernization initiative, for example, is coming from funds outside of its official military budget. Lastly, because Chinese military equipment is sourced locally, it pays less for goods than the US does for its own equipment. And that's because the standard of living is lower in China, with lower wages and less benefits, which means cheaper production costs. When compared by purchasing power parity, China's budget is significantly closer to the US's than a first glance would lead one to believe. Any war between the US and China would be waged at sea and air, making comparisons of the two sides air forces and navies of utmost importance. The US operates an air fleet of 13,247 aircraft, easily dwarfing the Chinese air fleet of 3,285. When it comes to fighter aircraft, the two sides are close together, with the US having 1,957 fighters versus China's 1,200. American air mobility absolutely dwarfs Chinese mobility, though, with a transport fleet of 982 versus China's 286. Understandable given that the US faces conflicts far from its own shores, and China has little need to move its own forces significant distances. However, the massive advantage in airlift capability makes the US military much more flexible and agile than the Chinese military. Perhaps the most important distinction between the two air forces, though, is the number of special mission aircraft, with the US operating 774 versus China's 114. The US has placed a premium on equipping aircraft for everything from early warning to electronic and signals intelligence and anti-submarine warfare. The US dwarfs China in special mission capabilities, and it's part of what makes the US Air Force and Navy so lethal. Unless a confrontation between the US and China takes place on Taiwan, attack helicopters won't figure into the equation. However, if they do, the US outnumbers China with 910 versus China's 281. Numbers only tell part of the story, though, because the weapon systems used by both sides only further skew the advantage to the US. For air superiority, the US fields the F-15 Eagle and F-18 Super Hornet. A fleet of 187 operational F-22s are unmatched by China, who has yet to field its own fifth-generation fighter in any significant numbers. Adding to China's problem is the US's Rapid Raptor program, which aims to bring a sizable contingent of F-22s to any battle space in the world within 24 hours. China's competitor versus the Raptor is the J-20, which is equipped with inferior engines versus American planes, requiring the use of canards on the body of the plane. These canards and other obvious engineering flaws have led to defense analysts to conclude the J-20 has at best only a slightly smaller radar cross-section 
than a traditional fourth-generation fighter. In fact, India claims it has frequently observed and tracked Chinese J-20s with long-range radar. The rest of the Chinese Air Force varies widely in modernity, with a significant part of its Air Force still flying Cold War Russian-made or Chinese-licensed relics. While China would initially put its most modern fighters such as the J-16, J-11s, and Su-30s into the fight first, once those have been downed, it'll be increasingly reliant on older and older planes. Meanwhile, the United States doesn't just have a completely modern air fleet, but it's adding dozens of fifth-generation F-35s every year to its arsenal. The US Air Force now has over 280 F-35s it can bring to the fight, with an additional 157 being added a year across the various services. In a war where air power would be decisive, the U.S. not only has the numbers advantage but also the technological advantage. At sea, the U.S. Navy is outnumbered by the Chinese Navy, with 484 vessels versus China's 777. However, there are numbers once again only telling part of the story. The U.S. operates 11 aircraft carriers versus China's two, and American aircraft carriers can bring over 800 aircraft into the fight versus China's grand total of 70. China's inflated naval numbers take into account things like missile boats, of which it has 84, while the U.S. only operates 10. In terms of tonnage, the U.S. Navy has over twice the hardware of the Chinese Navy, 4.6 million tons versus 2 million tons. A better way to compare the capabilities of the two fleets is to use a modern metric, battle force missiles. This is a count of the total number of missiles that a fleet has for use in combat before requiring resupply. This includes anti-ship missiles, land attack missiles, surface-to-air missiles, and torpedoes. Excluded from the count are short-range self-defense missiles like the U.S.'s Sea Ram. In 2019, the U.S. Navy had 11,834 battle force missiles versus China's 5,250. The gap is narrowing but not significantly, with China adding 15 more Type 55 cruisers with 112 missile cells and 6 torpedo tubes each throughout the 2020s. That will increase total battle force missiles by 1,770, just over half of what the U.S. fields. Under the surface, China has the advantage with 71 submarines versus the U.S.'s 68. However, Chinese subs are mostly conventionally powered, while the U.S. subs are all nuclear. That makes U.S. submarines much more robust and able to operate for longer, but also decreases their vulnerability while operating. Chinese submarines are also an order of magnitude louder than U.S. subs, with their Jin-class ballistic missile submarines having an acoustic signature of around 120 decibels, while American Virginia-class submarines have an acoustic signature of 95 decibels, which is just 5 decibels over background ocean noise at an average of 90 decibels. Submarine warfare has always been a weakness of China, and it looks to continue being so for the foreseeable future. While the U.S. clearly has the naval advantage, it's important to remember that China can concentrate most of its fleet into a Pacific war against America, while the U.S. has naval commitments around the world. Even if it were to recall the bulk of its fleet for action in the Pacific, such an act would take from days to weeks to mature into a sizable transit of combat power into the theater. Realistically speaking, the U.S. Navy maintains an edge over China, but the two sides are very close to parity in terms of capabilities. Where the U.S. advantage comes is in its ability to quickly replenish combat losses with well-trained crews and modern ships, while Chinese combat losses are not so easily replaced. Further honing America's advantage over China is its partnership with regional powers such as Japan and Australia, who would either allow the U.S. to use their territory as bases of operation for war against China or very likely join the conflict itself. A new trilateral defense pact between the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia is even seeing the U.S. building nuclear attack submarines for Australia on the condition that in case of war, it will join in the effort against the People's Liberation Army, Navy, and Air Force. America's advantage in equipment and technology is sizable and looks set to remain so, but it's the U.S. global partnerships and championing of liberal values that present the greatest likely insurmountable challenge for China. Until the Chinese Communist Party changes its core values, if it wishes to fight against America, it's picking a fight against most of the free world. Today we'll be comparing the two largest countries in the world in terms of population, with India set to be the most populated country in the world by 2022. Both nations have seen widespread economic progress in recent times, thanks to China's economic reform and the liberalization of India's economy. Presently, China has the second largest economy in the world behind the United States, although according to Fortune, America's economy will not be the world's largest for much longer. According to some analysts, in the near future, India also has a chance of becoming the world's largest economy again. While both countries still experience high poverty rates, some progress has been made. 
A lot of this new money, however, has been as much about social progress as it has defense matters. Today we'll compare these two emerging economies in this episode of the Infographic Show, India vs. China. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. Let's start with the larger of the two nations, both in terms of population and economy, which is China. We should note that in 2017, the World Bank said that China's economy shows signs of slowing down while India's is still revving up. And we already know that India is expected to have the world's largest population in a few years. China's GDP for 2016 was 11 plus trillion dollars, second only to the USA whose GDP is 18 plus trillion dollars. The European Union would be in second place, but we cannot count that as a country. According to an article in Bloomberg published in 2016, at projected growth rates, China should have the world's largest economy by 2028. Not surprisingly, China has seen increased spending on defense, and in 2016 that amount was $146 billion. The Guardian puts it higher at around $150 billion. Behind the USA, this is the most any country spends on its defense. India's 2016 GDP was around $2.3 trillion, making it the seventh largest economy in the world. Analysts state that at projected growth rates, that will be $6.84 trillion by 2030. Of that, $52.2 billion went to defense for the year 2016 to 2017. This means India is the fifth biggest spender on defense behind the US, China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. With such a fast-growing economy, it's expected that India will significantly increase the military budget over the coming years. Now let's have a look at how many people stand behind these budgets. China has the largest population in the world with 1.38 billion people, the country has around 2,335,000 active frontline personnel, and over 1.4 million active reserve personnel and paramilitary forces. This is the largest army in the world, almost double the size of the USA and India. North Korea also has a very large army if you count all those people on standby with some military training. India's population is 1.31 billion people, almost 1.4 million of whom are active military personnel. 1,155,000 people are serving as reserve personnel. If you've seen our show on the world's best elite forces, you'll know that part of this army is the elite Indian Marcos. This is of some importance when comparing militaries, given that these guys have had their hands full for a long time on the India-Pakistan border. In 2017, it was announced that on top of technological modernization, Chinese President Xi Jinping intends to invest heavily on its own elite military force. Now, let's get down to questions of hardware. Both countries have been very busy updating their arsenal of weapons on land, in the air, and at sea. According to sources, China has 9,150 main battle tanks, 4,788 armored fighting vehicles, 1,710 self-propelled guns, 6,246 towed artillery, and 1,770 multiple launch rocket systems. We should note that various sources give different numbers. Some equipment might be out of date and not usable, while there is constant growth. China's cream of the crop is its third generation VT-4 main battle tank, which its military claims is the best battle tank on the planet. The country is also the proud owner of a large fleet of Type 99 and 96 tanks. China is sometimes said to have the third best tank force in the world behind the USA and Russia. But guess who's fourth? You guessed it, India. India has around 5,978 main battle tanks, 6,704 armored fighting vehicles, 290 self-propelled guns, 7,414 towed artillery, and 292 multiple launch rocket systems. Some of this hardware is said to be in need of an upgrade, but that's just what India is doing right now. It has a large force of T-72 tanks, but it's also the owner of the highly touted Russian-made T-90 tank. According to Bloomberg in 2017, the country spent millions on upgrading its almost 1,000 strong fleet of T-90s, a force to be reckoned with given that the T-90 is often on the list of the world's best tanks. India also has initiated the Field Artillery Rationalization Plan, in which $3 billion will be spent on 3,000 to 4,000 pieces of new artillery. In 2016, national interest put China behind the USA as the second most lethal air force by the time we reach 2030. From its around 1,300 total aircraft, China has a large number of Russian Su-35s and Su-27s, with the former being one of the best aircraft ever made. But China's ace up its sleeve are the Chengdu J-20 and J-31 stealth fighters, aircraft which US analysts have agreed are a feat of engineering. This is one reason why China is such a threat. India didn't make national interest lists. India is said to be the fourth largest air force in the world in terms of personnel and aircraft. From its 1,720 aircraft, about 900 are combat capable. Its fleet consists of Russian-built Sukhoi Su-30 MKIs and Mikoyan MiG-29s, as well as the highly rated French-built multi-role fighter, the Dassault Mirage 2000. The latter is certainly up there as one of the best military aircraft ever built, but will India have the money to invest as much as China is in buying or developing its own top-of-the-range machines?
As for the ocean, China again is very strong. The country has one aircraft carrier, 25 destroyers, three amphibious transports, 42 frigates, eight nuclear attack submarines, and around 50 conventional attack submarines. The country is investing a ton of money on updating its navy, which includes two new state-of-the-art supercarriers, enough to make any country's military quiver. These should be ready in 2020 and 2023 respectively. By that time, only the USA, UK, and China will have ships of that size. Although just a few years later it is expected that India will have its own supercarrier in the form of the INS Vishal. It is also expected to be a work of military art, but it is early days yet. Right now, India is one of a few countries to have an aircraft carrier, and it also owns 11 destroyers, 14 frigates, 15 submarines, 23 corvettes, 0 amphibious assault ships, and 7 mine warfare ships. It is also a very powerful navy, but it is said to lack submarine strength, unlike China. As we know, the USA and Russia have the lion's share of nuclear weapons, but China has around 270 of these weapons. The actual amount has been the focus of considerable speculation, with some analysts stating that China has many more nuclear weapons hidden underground. We should add that this has not been confirmed, and some critics have said it's hogwash. India also has nuclear strength, owning around 120 nuclear warheads. In conclusion, both militaries are growing in power, and both countries are leading the world with a handful of other nations in terms of technology. You could say China has more tools in the box, but India certainly is not too far behind. Imagine the scene. It's July 2023. In a meeting, Vietnam's Minister for Culture, Sports and Tourism is furious, his face twisted into a picture of superlative disgust. Behind him on a large screen is an image of a pretty blonde American lady decked out in a smart button-up dress. I want this movie banned, he snarls. I want every single image, digital, paper or even printed on a little girl's knapsack removed from this country and dumped into the trash can of fake history. He's talking about Barbie a blockbuster movie that has divided the West on socio-cultural grounds, but one that's angered and offended Vietnam on a much higher level. Why? Because Barbie, as some people have said, is an assault on men, or according to another critic, is a flaming piece of dog poop, a Death Star-sized piece of drac that teaches children all the wrong things. No, is the answer. Vietnam could give a rat's behind about polarizing Western world issues. What's incensed the country is an image that appeared in a Barbie scene we just mentioned featuring China's perhaps indelicate nine dash line. In fact, the Barbie movie is not the first film that Vietnam has banned over this line. Nine highly offensive dark dashes demarcating what critics say is China's brazen territorial claim. Malaysia and the Philippines have also banned American movies over nine dashes, a problem for Hollywood's bottom line, but a feather in the cap for China. The issue of that now infamous line has been heating up lately. It doesn't look like this story will have anything close to a Hollywood happy ending. Rather, violence is probably on the not-too-distant horizon, which, as you'll see later, has many citizens of Asian nations worried. The USA plays a major role in this existential concern, of course. We'll come back to the present scraps and squabbles soon, but first, we need to look at how this line came into being in the first place. We must ask ourselves, how can China be so bold as to claim so much of this area as its own? Are its long territory-grabbing fingers acting within their rights, or is China being the schoolyard bully of the South China Sea? First, you must understand some history to understand China's rather big claim. As some of you know, for centuries China was quite an isolated nation. It was very advanced, though. So when those first Europeans went there and marveled at various Chinese inventions, the Chinese would often refer to those Westerners as uncivilized barbarians. When those enterprising Europeans started to exploit the world's natural resources, sailing around the world to do business and often kill and conquest, China still remained mostly isolated. During the height of the European Industrial Revolution in 1820, despite the British and the rest of Western Europe churning out newfangled money-making industrial machinery, China easily had the world's largest economy. That year, the country's economy was about six times bigger than Britain's, which was the largest economy in Europe. China's economy at the time also dwarfed the USA by about 20 times. In fact, China and India at that point together made up 49% of the world's GDP. The British went on to govern India, 1858 to 1947. Some say rob India blind, but getting to China's wealth became a different kind of ballgame. Presently, China will waste no time telling the world about its superpower prowess in those days, but the country also believes the imperialists robbed it at a time when those imperialists were getting very good at making weapons. It's important to understand this widespread conviction in China when trying to understand the country's present territorial claims. In a nutshell, the Europeans weren't happy about China's isolationism. They wanted to do business. The Brits, through the East India Company, especially didn't like China snubbing trade. The Brits hated the fact that China would only sell its very popular products, such as tea and silk, in exchange for British silver. 
This created a trade imbalance, and one way to get around that was by illegally selling opium from British India to China. As effectively the first large drug trafficking cartel in history, the Brits went from selling 200 chests of opium a year in 1729 to 10,000 chests per year between 1820 and 1830. In 1838, Britain was selling about 40,000 chests, helped along by very dodgy Chinese officials and drug dealers in the port of Canton. Meanwhile, China had an opiate crisis on its hands that makes the US opiate crisis today look like an opiate triviality. The British were acting kinda like a big pharma slash Sinaloa cartel of the 1800s. Millions of Chinese were addicted to this old school Oxycontin. A UN report said at the height of the crisis, one in four Chinese adults were spending their days nodding out on opium. Not good for society at all. In short, the Chinese fought back by burning a huge amount of British opium, and after some more incidents, the two countries ended up going to war. The Europeans with their new technologies were certainly very advanced. Barbarians maybe, but barbarians that could easily outclass China in a fight. The Brits by then had far superior battleships and weapons. China was riddled with corruption, official misinformation got back to Beijing, and so the Brits easily won what's now called the First Opium War. For the next century or thereabouts, Western European powers as well as Japan, Russia, and the US to some extent beat China up in a series of wars and conflicts that ended with brutal treaties now known as unequal treaties, and the superpower China gradually turned into what was called the sick man of Asia. It lost so much, including lots of territory, China was carved up and plundered. Imperialism is ferocious, Chairman Mao Zedong said years later, even if he was a tyrant of the highest order. China now calls this the century of humiliation, and often you'll hear political rhetoric in China telling people never again. For you to appreciate the present beef over these nine dashes, you have to understand that bit of history. We only gave you a small snapshot, but it'll do for now. China claims that its nine dash line, which encompasses close to 90% of the 3 million square kilometers in the South China Sea, is its own blue national soil. The country claims indisputable sovereignty over this area based on its days as a powerhouse in the region before it started losing parts of the territory to the likes of Britain, Japan, and France. Nonetheless, you'd be within your rights to ask why China gets this territory when indeed the South China Sea is surrounded by many countries, including Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and Taiwan. You need to know something about the latter. Taiwan, aka the Republic of China (ROC), was annexed in 1683 by China's Qing Dynasty, only to lose it to the Emperor of Japan in 1895 as part of the Treaty of Shimonoseki. This was another one of those so-called unequal treaties that China doesn't look so fondly upon. In 1945, the war ended and allied China retook control of Taiwan, but this time under the ROC. The ROC had overthrown the Qing Dynasty in 1911. After World War II, China, being one of the main allies, was judged deserving of a bit of territory. There were no real big squabbles when in 1947, a Chinese cartographer named Yang Huaren drew a line in the sand, or should we say the sea. Didn't really concern the West back then. China had just lost 15 to 20 million people, second only to the Soviet Union in terms of World War II deaths. This was an 11 dash line, not a 9 dash line. The reason for the two missing dashes is because of the infamous Mao Zedong who, in 1952, abandoned China's claim to the area known as the Gulf of Tonkin. The reason why Mao was in power then is that Mao's forces had defeated the ROC, which the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek headed. At the end of this brutal civil war, the nationalists, military, governance, and civilians retreated to Taiwan in their millions, an act known as the Great Retreat. They thought about coming back to reclaim China, but this plan, named Project National Glory, never came to fruition. The People's Republic of China (PRC) was staying, even if it was later weakened after Mao's crazy development plans aka Great Leap Forward and his bloody oppression aka Cultural Revolution that together cost tens of millions of Chinese lives. So there were two competing claims to China, but we should remember that it was the nationalist Yang Huaren who drew the map. When the nationalists skipped off to Taiwan, they still claimed the territory that lied within the 11 dashes that they'd drawn. Mao had nothing to do with the map when it was created. So you might ask, how did China, the nationalists or the communists, think they could lay claim to all that territory? Surely you can't just draw a map and, well, that's that. Well, China might respond, that's exactly what we did. Often Chinese scholars like to point out that it was only doing what the imperialists in the West had done for centuries. And as you now know, China in its heyday was indeed the regional hegemon. It now says it claimed these territories during that period of strength, 
China says there's plenty of evidence regarding its historical claims. The country was never really a seafaring nation, unlike Britain and France, but China said it did do a fair bit of moving around the South China Sea, more so, it says, than the other countries currently claiming space in the water. There are the Spratly Islands, a 164,000 square mile area named after a 19th century British sea captain named Richard Spratly. Right now, there's a military presence on the 100 or so reefs and atolls, not only from the PRC but also Malaysia, Taiwan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Let's now take a look at China's claim. The country says long before the British named this area, in the 2nd century BC, it named them the Nansha Islands, which became the Changsha when the Tang and Song dynasties were around in 618 to 1279. China claims it was the first country to develop some of those islands. It also says in the Guangzhou records written by the Jin dynasty, there's talk about Chinese fishermen in this area. China maintains that the Ming and Qing dynasties in 1368 to 1911 wrote about the Hainan Island fishermen in the area, and later they wrote about fixed shipping lanes there. China also likes to remind people that the British Navy Sea Guide once stated, Hainan fishermen dotted on every island live on sea cucumbers and shellfish. Some of them also inhabit the islands. Then in 1933, a French newspaper says China reported, between Annam and the Philippine Islands is a group of coral islands dotted with sandbanks and submerged reefs which voyagers see as perilous and not dare enter rashly. There's also thick growth of grass, and some Chinese people from Hainan live on the islands engaging in fishing. On top of that, China says that the Cheng He navigational charts written by the Ming Dynasty record activity on the Nansha Islands. It says there are two Qing Dynasty maps, one dated 1716 and another 1817, which both include these islands. A Chinese website edited by Wang Xiaohua, vice minister of the Central Propaganda Department of the Chinese Communist Party wrote, In 1883, Germany stopped its invasion activities on the Nansha Islands in the face of protests from the Qing government. In 1933, French occupation of the Nansha Islands met with resistance from Chinese fishermen, after which the Chinese government made firm its claim to the territory, which resulted in France's eventual retreat. China says in 1946 the Chinese government, according to the Cairo Declaration and Potsdam Proclamation, regained its sovereignty over the South China Sea islands and reefs and re-erected a monument of sovereignty on the main island. China also claims that in 1951, at the time of the Japanese Peace Treaty Draft and San Francisco Conference Statement, Chinese former President Xiao Enlai was quoted saying the area within the Nine Dash Line was China's territory. In 1958, in the Declaration on the Territorial Sea, the PRC again laid claim to these islands. We have a few things to unpack here in defense of those that say China still doesn't get to claim the territory. Many nations have texts that say their fishermen traveled through a certain area. That's not the same as having sovereignty there. There are even caves on one of the Spratly Islands that show us humans were there around 50,000 years ago. It doesn't mean they had sovereignty. And for sure, as China was easily the most advanced nation in the area, it drew up maps with the islands and talked about them, but that still doesn't mean China had sovereignty over them. Just because you draw a map and include some islands doesn't mean you own them. In fact, as China was exploring these islands, Vietnam was also in the area, claiming to have discovered these new territories. Both nations were doing the same thing. Europeans were in the area too, although when a 1758 map by a man named William Herbert referred to the Spratly Islands, it just called the area dangerous ground, and it didn't mention much else. It's true that in the 1880s when the Germans started sailing around the Spratly and Paracel Islands, the Chinese told their ships to leave ASAP. And it's true that China laid flags down on some of the islands in 1902 and 1907, but this still doesn't tell us China has the legal right to the territory. In fact, China's history shows us that the country's land boundaries were never clearly defined. The argument against China is that China, the ancient civilization of China, didn't have any clear and defined boundaries, but now it's pretending it did. That's not how China worked in the past, so why is it trying to work this way now, say the Western critics? Chinese history shows us that suzerainty was always China's modus operandi, not conquest with added new boundaries. Suzerainty, by the way, means just having control over a country or territory, even if that country has some amount of autonomy and is allowed to self-govern. For instance, China did have suzerainty in Vietnam, but it never strictly ruled it. Another for instance, in 1770, Lieutenant James Cook, the captain of HMB Endeavour, claimed part of the Australian continent for the British Crown. He called it New South Wales. He told the indigenous folks their land now belonged to the British. The King of England had told Cook to take the land with the consent of the natives, but let's face it, the natives didn't really have a say in the matter. The Brits colonized Australia. Australia was not a tributary state. 
Right or wrong, those imperialistic Brits did not claim suzerainty. They took Australia and later dumped many of their criminals there. They also massacred Aboriginal people whenever there was resistance to the colonization of their country. Maybe Mao was right and the imperialists were ferocious, but that still doesn't mean China gets to claim any territory where once a handful of fishermen hung out in the water. Western academics say in China there was no such thing as claiming sovereignty over an area. They say the Europeans invented that kind of thing after 8 million people died during the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century. These nations introduced the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, which included the Westphalian system, a system that said there should be international laws and rules, and states that have exclusive rights in their territories. Asia did not adopt the law, not until the 20th century anyway. It's the international law now, but it wasn't when China claims to have done its island hopping. So China, they say, never had sovereignty over the South China Sea Islands. Making historical claims based on who was there at one point in history doesn't give you sovereignty in the future. The Diplomat magazine argued that if this was the case, since Taiwan was originally settled by the people of Malay Polynesian, then the Malay people have more of a righteous claim on Taiwan than the PRC. It doesn't make sense to think this way. It would mean Mongolia could make claim to just about all of Asia. Until recently, Chinese maps didn't even focus on the South China Sea. Then in 2009, China had a dispute with Vietnam and suddenly it took to the UN a map with nine dashes on it. These days, the nine dashes are a source of national pride. You can even find them in Chinese passports. China suddenly wants what it never initially claimed. In 2012, when these new Chinese passports came out, the government in the Philippines wouldn't even stamp visa pages and said the stamps must go on a separate sheet of paper. At the time, the Philippines was fighting with China over the Scarborough Shoal, an area where China wants air and naval bases. China's been very busy for about a decade turning reefs and shoals into fortified military bases, setting off alarm bells in the Pentagon. In China's so-called Great Wall of Sand, what were small reefs have been dredged and concreted over, after which runways at barracks and anti-aircraft weapons and missile defense systems have popped up. This concerns the US more than fishing rights or oil, but the US can also put pressure on countries to go against China. Then again, China can do the same as it has substantial power in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Just recently, China and ASEAN agreed to attempt to conclude their non-aggression pact on the sea feuds for at least three years. As all you historians out there know, such feuds could escalate and lead to a potential world war. Let's remember here that in a world war, these islands and reefs could prove to be a good strategic base. It's also worth noting that about a third of all maritime trade goes through the South China Sea, equal to around 4.4 trillion of trade annually. That's another reason why the USA has been sailing ships through the South China Sea under Freedom of Navigation Operations, or PHONOPS. Critics inside the US have said this risks escalation, but it seems the US is not going to stop. The US has undertaken nine phone ops since 2015, which has infuriated China. By undertaking these cheeky journeys, the US is basically saying China has no right to these territories. So again, these islands meant less to China not too long ago, but now the nine dashes are firmly implanted in most Chinese people's minds. They're told time and again that there will not be another period of humiliation, never again. Despite the shaky historical evidence that everything within the line is China's, the people are made to think the evidence is solid. They are also rightly concerned about their existence, which has improved a hell of a lot over the last 20 years. When Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke in March 2023 to the 14th National People's Congress, he talked about when China was turned into a semi-colonial society, when bullying foreigners plunged China into an abyss of great suffering and tore the country apart. The people listened intently. He had a point. China did get done over, but Xi's compelling rhetoric still doesn't mean China has a right to the territory. Nonetheless, China has done a phenomenal job pulling almost a billion people out of poverty since its economic boom. It's done well under its Belt and Road Initiative, spreading its influence all over the world. The US will try everything in its power to stop that influence from expanding. It's a big reason why NATO has been forming new partnerships with the Asia-Pacific nations, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. Meanwhile, Vietnam banned Barbie, which if there is a third world war might go down as something similar to Hitler invading Poland or Archduke Fran Ferdinand's assassination. Just kidding. We hope. Vietnam actually banned the movie Uncharted too for the same reason. Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines all banned the innocent animated movie Abominable. The Nine Dash line barely appeared in the background in just one scene, but that was enough. They might not have the same existential fears of the US, they might have more financial concerns, although they might also be getting a push from the US. 
As we said, these nine dash line disagreements effectively kicked off in 2009. That was when Malaysia and Vietnam submitted territorial claims in the South China Sea. China made a formal diplomatic response to the UN, stating, China has indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and the adjacent waters and enjoys indisputable sovereign rights and jurisdiction over the relevant waters as well as the seabed and subsoil thereof. This contained a copy of the Nine Dash Line to protest the Malaysian-Vietnam submission. China claimed the line was widely known by the international community. Then in 2016, the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention Tribunal ruled that China's claim isn't based on any kind of international law. Even so, China rejected this ruling and it continues to do what it wants in the region. The US has said it does not agree with China's claims, which is evident with those phone ops it's been doing, but the US can't really do much about China's bullying tactics. It can't strong arm the issue. The US hasn't even put its name on the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is there to deal with such disputes. The country says, Part of the convention is unfavorable to its own economic and security interests, but that doesn't help matters where China's island grabs are concerned. It should also be noted that the US did not support the Philippines in 2016. As we said, these disputes are not only about China's expanding military installations. Countries in the region have been arguing about natural resources for years. The area is a fishing gold mine. While there's an estimated 11 billion barrels of untapped oil down there, not to mention about 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. No wonder then that Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Vietnam all stake claims in the South China Sea. It only became known in the later 1960s that hydrocarbon resources were there, and this is what reignited the interest in the region. In May 1970, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan held talks regarding joint energy exploration in the East China Sea, and that's when China started making new claims. In 1972, the Philippines struck oil off the coast of Palawan Island. There was lots of bickering to follow, and even though in 1982 a resolution was reached under the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, it didn't really address sovereignty issues concerning the South and East China Seas. Then in 1988, China sank three Vietnamese ships and killed 70 sailors in another beef about territory in the region. China fought with the Philippines in 1996 in what was called the Mischief Reef Incident. Later in 2002, China and 10 Aishan nations signed the Aishan China Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea to prevent such conflicts from happening again. Further on, China signed an agreement with Japan, again related to energy, and in 2010, when China was looking like it was at the peak of its growing economic powers, the US stopped being neutral regarding the South China Sea. That's when Hillary Clinton said in a speech that the US had an interest in what she called open access to Asia's maritime commons. Soon after, China started building its Great Wall of Sand, and in 2015, the US did its first phone ops, which China's ambassador to the US said was a serious provocation. A regional dispute was now a much bigger dispute and became much more of a concern to the US in 2018 when a Chinese H-6 bomber landed and took off from Woody Island in the Paracel Islands. In 2020, Vietnam condemned China when it opened up administrative structures on the islands in the Paracels and the Spratlys. Again, China just keeps doing what it's doing and throwing its nine-dash line in front of naysayers' faces. The US sees China as a threat. China sees the US as a threat, especially with its new NATO footprints in Asia. Unless there is some serious detente diplomacy, it's hard to see how this all won't end very badly. People in Asia understand this very well. A recent poll was undertaken by the Eurasia Group Foundation, which conducted a survey in three Asian nations, Singapore, South Korea, and the Philippines. All these nations had significant ties with both China and the US. Red, they'll have to take a side. 90% of respondents said they're worried about a US-China confrontation, 66% were somewhat worried, 24% were very worried, 62% of all the nations said their national security will be put at risk, but 81% in the Philippines said that. Interestingly, around a third of the respondents said they have a positive view of both Chinese and American culture in their country, although some more people said they had a favorable view of the US at 70% than they do of China at 34%. South Korea had the most people that said they have a very unfavorable view of China at 38%, while Singaporeans, only 10% of them, mind you, took a very dim view of the US. It's doubtful any of them want to be stuck in the middle of a war, but if the world can't evolve out of balance of power politics, that's what's going to happen.
One of the things China and the USA have in common is the fact that they're both about the same size. In terms of land area, the US is 3,532,000 square miles, or 9,148,000 square kilometers, not including overseas territories. China is 3,601,000 square miles, or 9,325,000 square kilometers, and no, that doesn't include Taiwan or Hong Kong. Today, we'll attempt to fit the Chinese population inside of the USA and see what happens, and the results might not be what you think. First, we should learn a bit about the populations of each country. Populations are, of course, always changing, but the website Worldometers tries to give an accurate number of the people living in all nations. As we write this, the website tells us that the population of China is 1,419,803,000. We don't need to tell you that it keeps going up and up. The USA has a much smaller but still large population of 328,972,000. So for every one person living in the USA, there's about 4.6 people living in China. Given that massive population, does that make China the most densely populated country in the world? No, not by a long shot. It's the very smallest countries that have the densest populations. China has a population density of roughly 375 per square mile, or 145 per square kilometer. While in 2014, Hong Kong, which is part of China but still an autonomous territory, had a population density of a whopping 6,690 people per square kilometer. Even the UK is much more densely populated than China, which is only the 59th most densely populated country in the world. The USA is actually one of the most spacious countries out there and comes in at 146th on the list. As we said, China and the USA are very close in geographic landmass. You could almost fit one snugly into the other if you played around with the shapes a little bit. But in terms of how spacious a place feels, it really means how packed the populated areas are. A remote mountain area in China is as crowded as a remote mountain area in the USA. So which country has the busiest cities in terms of finding space? According to the most recent estimates available, in 2018, New York City was the most populated city in the USA, with 8,399,000 residents living there. Los Angeles is way behind, at 3,990,000. For New York, there's a population density of 28,317 people per square mile. That makes it the most cramped city in the USA. LA only has 8,484 people per square mile. Shanghai has a much larger population of 26,316,000. But is it more cramped than New York City? Actually, it isn't. Shanghai has a population density of only around 11,000 people per square mile. So New Yorkers would actually feel like they had more space if they were living in Shanghai while Shanghai residents might consider New York City to be a bit cramped for their tastes. Most sources consider Manila in the Philippines to be the world's most densely populated city, with 107,561 people for every square mile, while others say it's actually Dhaka, Bangladesh. Shanghai, by the way, is 2,448 square miles in area, or 6,341 square kilometers. New York City is much smaller, at only 468.48 square miles, or 1,213 square kilometers. These are each country's biggest cities in terms of population, but there is a long list of Chinese cities with populations bigger than New York. We tell you this, of course, because if the Chinese population was suddenly moved over to the US, then they would most likely have to populate the cities. If we dropped, say, the population of Beijing, about 22 million and 3,400 people per square mile, next to Mount Katad in northern Maine, we'd have a problem as there is no infrastructure. So when we talk about upping the US population, we're focusing on the places people can live. As we said, China's huge population means the country has a much greater number of large population cities. When you look at lists of world's largest cities by land area, whether urban area or metropolitan area, Chinese cities make up a lot of the lists, as do Indian cities. In fact, in the top 50 largest cities, we only see New York City on the list from the USA, whereas China makes the top 50 a staggering 23 times. What this means, of course, is that if the USA had the same population as China and city dwellers remained city dwellers, then many cities in the USA would be extremely crowded places. China can deal with that many people. The US would struggle. Okay, so what would the consequences be of this population explosion? 
Well, if it happened at once, say by magic, all hell would break loose. If the population was the same ratio of children to adults, there'd be too many children to feed and too many adults for jobs, not to mention a lot of houses with too few beds. Could this happen? Obviously not, but if it ever could, it would have to mean something happened which resulted in a huge migration to the USA. We might have to invoke alien attack here because we don't feel this could be anything but science fiction. According to the IMF's World Economic Outlook database, the nominal GDP for the USA in 2018 was the highest in the world at $19.39 trillion. China was $12.01 trillion. If we look at this in very simplistic terms, it should mean there's enough cash in the USA to feed a population that was the same as China's. Although massive changes in the allocation of funds, new taxes, and changes to monetary policy would have to happen. Still, there's little doubt this new population could eat. It would just mean some growing pains for a while. Let's say things were straightened relatively quickly thanks to American ingenuity. There would still be too many people filling cities that once had far fewer people. There would have to be a drastic expansion, and that would mean spending an incredible amount of money on infrastructure. But given the USA's incredibly high defense budget, which could be slashed, and so many billionaires ready to be taxed, we think that this could be done without a total catastrophe. Things would be tough at first, and no doubt a lot of the population would be up in arms, but once they knew they had no choice, they'd deal with it. In our sci-fi, hypothetical, crowded America, we're assuming people of the world, for the most part, would be willing to collaborate to build a bigger, better America. One of the very real problems with this influx of new folks would be the degradation of natural spaces and depletion of resources. As Jared Diamond points out in his very real book, Collapse, parts of the USA are already suffering from the overconsumption of natural resources and the negative effect this is causing on the environment. More people means more pollution. It means more polluting industries, more cars, more houses, more degradation of farmland. There would no doubt be some scarcity. Fish depleted rivers would need to be filled people might even have to learn how to be more self-sustainable. People would also have to put their trust in the government and a whole group of roundtable experts would have to get busy coming up with ways to accommodate these new folks without taking the USA to the brink of collapse. Diamond points out that societies have completely disappeared in the past because there just wasn't enough resources to accommodate a growing number of people. But the point he makes is that collapse in hindsight was probably always avoidable had those societies been savvier about overconsumption and the sustainability of natural resources. Some societies chopped down all their forests in part so they could build monuments to show how strong they were. Bad move. In the new US, people would care less about what they had. There would be less conspicuous consumption and more people would embrace a kind of communitarian life. No, that doesn't mean communism, it means working together for the greater good. There would have to be a profound change in habits and some great innovations. Let's just say because of these A-teams of innovators and a public willing to make profound lifestyle changes, the plan came together. Would a more crowded America sink into poverty? We think the answer is no, not at all. More people means more brains, more innovation, and you work with what you got. Sure, parts of America that have been historically underpopulated would have more people, but those people could and would be useful. We call this sci-fi situation the Great Expansion, and it wouldn't be that different from the expansion America saw in the 19th century when wagon trains, many full of immigrants, went west to stake claims in new territory. It could be a catalyst that made people think more about the environment and act in a way that aligns with human progress and happiness. America would deal with the Great Expansion, but modern Americans like their hardworking forefathers would learn to find greatness as the country builds a new frontier. Imagine what would happen if a country destroyed its tech industry overnight. In most cases, this would lead to economic collapse and societal chaos. Yet as you watch this video, China is doing just that. The craziest part is that the drastic actions taken by the Chinese government to dismantle their own tech industry might just save the country in the future. China has been a major player in the global tech industry since the early 2000s. However, it now seems that the Chinese government has done a full 180 and is trying to destroy all of the innovations and hard work its tech companies have engaged in over the past two decades. This seems insane, and it might just be, but many analysts believe that by cracking down on its tech sector, China might position itself to not just thrive but control many of the policies and regulations that will govern how tech companies operate around the world. Make no mistake, China is not just implementing a few regulations, they are actively destroying specific parts of their tech industry in order to force a major paradigm shift. In recent years, tech icons like Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, have disappeared. 
and China has leveled incredibly huge fines against some of their most lucrative tech companies. The Chinese government is not just trying to regulate certain companies in their country, they are trying to eviscerate them. So how could a government waging war on one of its biggest economic sectors be good for it? Let's pick China's policies and regulations apart and see if there's any sanity in what they're doing. It should come as no surprise that the regulations are being put in place as a way for President Xi Jinping to seize power from major tech giants. He's also using this systematic reorganization to focus the sector on what he believes the future of China should be. Before the crackdown, most of China's biggest tech companies were concentrated on software, platforms, and apps that collect user data. This data was used for advertising and selling products to consumers and is exactly what Alibaba, which is basically the Amazon of China, has been doing since the early 2000s. Chinese companies were also investing large amounts of time and resources into cryptocurrency and various social media platforms. Xi and his associates want China's tech industry to move away from these superficial sectors and focus more on physical hardware such as microprocessors, robotics, semiconductors, and electric vehicles. In order to get the ball rolling, China enacted numerous regulations that would protect user data, increase cybersecurity, and squash anti-competitive practices. This might have hurt larger tech companies in China, but it hurt foreign companies working in China that could not comply with the new regulations even more. This provided small and medium-sized Chinese tech companies an advantage in the hopes that it would lead to greater innovation. The anti-monopoly rules that China's put in place keep large tech companies from scooping up all their competitors or forcing them out of business. This has helped smaller businesses survive, while also forcing tech giants to focus their attention on the expansion outside of China. This can be beneficial for the company itself, but also spreads China's power of influence. And when it comes down to it, many of the things she is doing to destroy the tech industry are so it can be rebuilt in a way that will provide China with more power. And although the Chinese government seems to have good intentions while dismantling the tech sector, analysts worldwide are nervous about the repercussions that might arise. As China's no-COVID policy slows production and leads to more and more protests and unrest, their economy is hurt. These factors, on top of the drastic changes being made to the tech industry, which accounts for over 30% of the country's GDP, should definitely set off some internal warning bells. But China is a huge market, which means it has leverage when it comes to its foreign and economic policies. China has a massive consumer base, so most companies need to play ball with their government to tap into the country's population. This means that even though the new tech laws and regulations might be restrictive and cause foreign companies to spend large sums of money to restructure their business models and conform to the new Chinese laws, they have no choice but to comply. The new personal information protection law, data security law, and anti-monopoly rules targeting the tech industry were taken from the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation. This means that tech companies operating in Europe should also be able to adjust their practices in China and vice versa. China's made it very clear that any company that does not meet their regulations will be fined heavily or in extreme circumstances won't be allowed to operate in China. This is not an option for most tech companies that rely on the Chinese market for a decent chunk of their profits. Businesses within and outside China are now changing their procedures to ensure they don't lose access to this vital market. This is good news for Chinese tech companies because it means that everyone's playing by the same rules. These new regulations have far-reaching effects. Since tech companies are changing their practices to allow them to operate in China, it means global economic norms are shifting as well. By forcing companies to conform to China's policies, it allows Chinese tech companies easier access to the global market. Basically, China is rewriting global tech rules through the dismantling of their own tech industry. But this is not all. In fact, the destruction of tech companies within China through their strict regulations has greatly benefited the government in a somewhat sinister way. Even though many of the restrictions China is placing on the tech industry have to do with data collection, the government is happy to continue these practices for its own purpose. These new laws require foreign tech companies operating in China to provide more detail while simultaneously restricting them from sharing data they collect about Chinese citizens with outside parties. This is a double-edged sword for tech companies. On one hand, they need to access the Chinese consumer, but on the other, they're providing the Chinese government with a massive amount of data that might allow them to force tech companies to do their bidding. This could lead to things such as the 2016 Apple Agreement that promised the company would increase spending within China by $275 billion. Obviously, this was a huge win for the Chinese economy and the government. So although the new laws are hurting Chinese tech companies, the pros far outweigh the cons for the Chinese government. But forcing foreign companies to adhere to their strict rules is only one part of the plan. 
By getting rid of tech monopolies in China, the government hopes to stimulate innovation. By hurting the tech companies that have become too big, China believes more competition will arise between smaller businesses. This often leads to advances on a particular industry, which is what China hopes will happen in their technology sector. Recently, only a handful of companies have dominated the industry. Whenever a new company comes up with a good idea or creates software that's better than what already exists, they're acquired by one of those corporations. Other times, these large tech firms use more nefarious practices such as stealing intellectual property. But since they control so much of the industry, there's very little a small company can do to stop them. To be fair, this is not just a problem in China. These types of predatory practices happen all the time around the world. Companies like Amazon, Apple, and Google constantly acquire competitors and have a slew of legal actions brought against them for stolen programs or property. Unfortunately, like with all tech giants, China's companies have an army of lawyers and strategists who ensure that more often than not, what the company wants, the company gets. However, China has now stripped away the ability of large tech firms to use such tactics within the country. It will not stop these practices completely, but it will force already established companies to compete with startups to improve their own products, because if they don't, they will lose customers. When we examine China's crackdown on the tech industry more closely, it's very clear that the decisions made were calculated and deliberate. Out of all the tech companies that have been fined or ruined by China's new regulations, around 95% were software or platform companies, while only the remaining 5% were hardware businesses. This paints a clear picture of the direction in which the Chinese government wants to take its technology sector. President Xi has made it very apparent he wants China to become more self-sufficient. He's even stated, Our dependence on core technology is the biggest hidden trouble for us. Heavy dependence on imported core technology is like building our house on top of someone else's walls. No matter how big and how beautiful it is, it won't remain standing during a storm. She knows that regardless of how powerful China's software and internet companies are, it won't matter if they can't build state-of-the-art computers or keep up with advances being made by other countries. Therefore, the main reason that such harsh regulations have been put into place to dismantle the Chinese tech industry is so the entire sector can begin pivoting toward hardware manufacturing and development while software is only relied on as a secondary product. Huge emphasis is being placed on microprocessors, robotics, and semiconductors. She and his advisors see this as the future, and they are likely right. Left to their own devices, the Chinese tech industry would continue mining user data and providing Chinese citizens ways to escape real life online through social media and in a future metaverse. This is because large tech companies have been doing this for years, and it's been very profitable. There's no incentive for these companies to focus on hardware when they could continue making money with online shopping, social media, and video games. But these things don't keep a country competitive in the global market, so it's clear that the destruction of China's tech companies is an attempt to force more innovation and to develop technological self-reliance for the country. Interestingly, the regulations are also being used to scare away certain companies. It might seem odd that China would want to force foreign businesses out of their market when they bring in considerable amounts of money for the economy, but like with everything else, it's all part of Xi's crazy plan. In Xi Jinping's mind, he's put China in a win-win situation. If foreign tech companies adhere to the new strict regulations, he'll have leverage over them. If they don't follow his regulations and decide to leave, Xi and his advisors believe that domestic companies will take their place. And of course, these businesses will be funded by an answer to the Chinese government. What this means is that either way, she has some form of control over all the tech companies manufacturing hardware within China's borders. Ideally, he wants the majority of hardware to be produced by state-sponsored businesses, but right now, he'll take either option. She and the other main players in the Chinese government have noticed how far behind the United States the country is in terms of semiconductor manufacturing, aerospace engineering, and biotech. Obviously, this is not what China wants, which is another reason for the overhaul of the tech industry. China is already a world leader in software and programming. This is why the government doesn't need to grow the industry further. Instead, they want to focus on China's shortcomings. In 2021, the Chinese government invested in all-time high in tech companies developing semiconductors and biotechnology. With all the new regulations and refocusing of the tech industry in China, other world powers have begun to take notice. Unsurprisingly, the United States is keeping a close eye on what's happening within their adversaries' borders. Even though the Chinese government's plan to destroy its tech industry might have seemed crazy at first, it now appears to be working. In February 2022, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce reported that the dismantling of China's tech industry was actually giving the country the money and talent it needed to develop an economic advantage over the U.S. It might seem unbelievable, 
but it would appear that China's destruction and reorganization of its tech sector is having the outcome they'd hoped for. China has doubled down on its plans, and the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology declared it would create 600 little giants in 2018. What they meant by this is that the government would back 600 startups that focused on hardware, strategic technologies, and computing equipment. They succeeded in this effort and have even expanded the number of these startups to 4,500. China plans to fund another 5,000 little giants over the next few years. The Chinese government is very serious about changing the way its tech industry operates, and as you'll see, it's not afraid of who gets hurt. Back in 2021, the Chinese government fined Alibaba $2.8 billion, the largest fine levied against a company ever. They did this by citing anti-competitive behavior perpetrated by the company. Alibaba is still operating and making profits, but this just goes to show how serious China is about restructuring its technology sector. This was not a one-off case. China has imposed huge fines on several big tech companies in the country. And although they're doing this to shift businesses toward hardware manufacturing, there's another, more sinister reason. The big tech companies gained too much power in the government's eyes. It was clear they could influence decisions made at even high levels and impact how the average Chinese citizen thought and acted. This was unacceptable to the government. As is well known, Xi does not handle threats to his power very well. The destruction of the tech giants in China is also being done to lessen their power and make sure the government is the only one controlling the general population. The government knew it was dangerous to allow non-state-run companies to have the ability to manipulate the public by collecting user data, controlling what social media and news content they saw, and providing them with online experiences they couldn't get enough of. Big tech companies overstepped, and in a country led by an authoritarian regime, threatening the government's power is never a good thing. The destruction of the tech industry was certainly motivated by the wants and needs of China to become more self-sufficient. However, it was also a play to consolidate power back to the government itself. But the government has also recognized an opportunity in the tech giants. Xi and those close to him saw how influential big tech companies had become and encouraged them to grow their user bases and footprint in other parts of the world. China's National Development and Reform Commission even released guidance on how software and platform companies could further expand their international capabilities to be competitive on the global stage. Really, what was happening was the Chinese government wanted these tech giants to stop siphoning money from the Chinese government and start bringing in more foreign money. It appears that tech companies listened to the commission and began expanding their influence beyond China's borders. In 2021, Tencent, a multimedia and video game company, extended their reach into Europe. Didi, a ride-hailing app, has a similar number of users as Uber in nine different countries. And let's not forget that TikTok is a Chinese company that beat Google as the world's most visited website for part of 2021. Once again, the Chinese government's crackdown on tech companies has done exactly what it hoped for. The rest of the world watched, stunned as fines and regulations were thrown at Chinese tech giants by their own government. Destroying the status quo within the industry allowed them to refocus on innovation, growth, and manufacturing, while also expanding China's influence via their tech companies' products and data collection across the world. The long-term effects of these decisions appear to benefit the Chinese people as well. The law now requires companies to report data breaches, which they were previously not required to do. Also, false advertising and misleading promotions now receive much harsher penalties, which better protect Chinese consumers from being scammed. These new laws required that tech companies clean up their acts and operate more ethically. International attention has even been drawn to several Chinese tech businesses as they've made it onto lists of companies that have improved digital rights. Obviously, not everyone's happy about China's success after blowing up their tech industry. For years, the United States has been outcompeting China in microchip and semiconductor technologies. However, in 2021, China's Yangtze Memory Technologies created a memory chip that outperformed the most powerful chips from both Intel and Samsung. The US has opened several investigations into Chinese tech companies and their practices, but these lawsuits cannot stop them from innovating and spreading their product to other countries across the globe. As of right now, OceanBase, which Alibaba funded, is the fastest database in the world. In fact, it is twice as fast as the second quickest database, which is run by the US company Oracle. Things are not going great right now in China, but this has little to do with the way the Chinese government cracked down on the tech industry. China spends around 70 billion more dollars than the US on research and development. This allows them to turn more innovations into commercial products for their own citizens and to be shipped around the world. The growth of China's GDP has slowed, 
but it is still increasing by almost twice as much as the US's. By all indications, the destruction and reorganization of the Chinese tech industry will only lead to more innovations, self-reliance, and a broader influence across the world. Even with what appears to be a successful shift in the way Chinese tech companies operate, there are still some doubts that China will manage to recover fully from this transition. Many analysts still believe that the Chinese government overextended itself by implementing too many regulations and fines on their tech giants. They cite a lack of freedom for the companies to operate how they see fit as a major problem. Also, the tight restrictions could lead certain tech firms to be so bogged down with legalities they won't be able to innovate or grow. It's hard to tell what exactly is going on within China, as most information coming out of the country comes from state-run sources. However, all we need to do is look at the products we rely on every day, the software we use and the websites we visit, to see how far the arm of the Chinese tech industry reaches. In the United States, large amounts of electronics come from China. People spend enormous amounts of time on TikTok, where user data is collected and shared with other companies and the Chinese government. So much of the criticism about the restructuring of the Chinese tech industry may be coming from fear rather than unbiased opinions. If nothing else, one thing is for sure. Chinese tech companies seem to be weathering the storm and innovating in new ways to keep them relevant. Over the next several years, industry leaders and governments will need to closely watch the tech, hardware, and platforms coming out of China. The unrest and policies in the country might stifle growth, but it's being dealt with similarly to how the tech industry was. Xi and his associates are cracking down hard. It is unclear whether this will lead to more protests or if it'll beat the Chinese people into submission. Although it is technically the People's Republic of China, the actual people have very little say in what happens. Xi Jinping is an authoritarian ruler and will not be given up his powers anytime soon. This is why Chinese tech companies have to comply with the onslaught of regulations, lawsuits, and fines. That being said, the tech industry seems to be ramping back up. Strides are being made with electric cars, artificial intelligence, and semiconductors. On top of that, China is becoming more self-reliant within its tech sector and investing heavily in biotechnology. If everything continues to go as planned, China will have the most dominant tech industry in the world. These are uncertain times and initially all signs pointed to a disaster when the Chinese government destroyed its tech industry, but it's coming back with a vengeance, which means that its demolition might have been what saved it. For the last 10 years, one city in southwestern China has been slaughtering thousands of dogs for what's known as the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. During this 10-day celebration that begins on the summer solstice, dogs are killed by the thousands and eaten. Why does this festival occur? Is it a tradition with deep cultural roots? Are there health benefits to consuming dog meat? The answers to these questions are not what you might expect. Fair warning, this will not be an easy video to watch, as the nature of this festival is truly terrible. The Yulin Dog Meat Festival, also known as the Yulin Lychee and Dog Meat Festival, takes place in Yulin, a city located in the Guangxishuang Autonomous Region of China. Leading up to the festival, thousands and thousands of dogs are rounded up from around the country to be transported to the city. The dogs are tightly packed into cages where they can barely move. They're then stacked up and transported via truck. The drive from parts of China back to Yulin can take days or even weeks. Oftentimes, the dogs in the middle of the crates suffocate to death and many of them die from starvation or disease. This is truly an awful and inhumane way to treat dogs, or any animal for that matter. Every culture has its own unique practices. It's important to remember that something we may find uncomfortable might be deeply ingrained in another culture or belief system. So is this true about the mass slaughter of dogs and consumption of their meat? Is this a practice that is deeply ingrained in Chinese culture? The answer is no, absolutely not. You may be thinking that perhaps this is a cultural tradition in the city of Yulin that dates back hundreds of years. If this is part of the history of the Yulin, that may explain why the festival occurs. Again, this is not the case either. In fact, the Yulin Dog Meat Festival only recently started about a decade ago. So why does this city in China bring thousands of dogs from around the country to a festival where they're killed and eaten if it's not an ancient cultural practice? Two words, greed and money. The festival itself was launched in 2009 by the dog meat traders of Yulin as a way to boost their sales. That's right, the reason thousands of dogs are tortured and killed each year is so the dog meat traders of the country can increase their profit. Let that sink in for a moment. Now to be fair, in the western world some companies do the exact same thing with cows and other livestock, but that's a story for another video. Prior to 2009, Yulin City had never had a dog meat festival before, and although dog meat consumption did happen, it was uncommon, and there certainly wasn't an established cultural tradition of dog eating in the city. Even though this is the case, the traders still claim that dog meat eating is ingrained in the Yulin city culture. 
This is a complete fabrication to try and justify the festival. If the premise behind the Yulin Dog Meat Festival was not already super messed up and corrupt, the way the dogs are procured brings things to a whole new level. Many of the dogs that are taken for the festival are strays and are just trying to survive in a world that refuses to help them. Others are actually stolen pets that still have their collars on when they're brought to Yulin. The dogs that survive the trip to the city are covered in urine and feces. Many also suffer from illnesses, dehydration, or heat stroke. While unloading the dogs from the trucks, the meat traders often throw the crates full of dogs down to the ground, causing even more pain and suffering to the animals. Originally, local officials endorsed and even encouraged the event as a way to attract tourists to the city. This did not happen, and instead it became a PR nightmare for the government. Animal rights organizations from within China and around the world condemned and protested the festival. However, there are still some people who flock to Yulin for the festival every year, which is one of the reasons why it's continued on. Cat meat, fresh lychee, fruits and alcohol are also sold at the festival as well. Some people believe that consuming dog meat can bring good health and luck, and it's here that we need to make an important distinction. Eating dog meat is seen as taboo to the overwhelming majority of Chinese people. We will say this again because it's so important. Most Chinese people do not see eating dog meat as okay and find it just as offensive as other parts of the world. There are relatively few people in the scheme of things that continue to follow this tradition or consume dog meat at all. It's also important to remember that some people might not have had a choice. People in rural areas or in poverty may have no other source of protein besides dog meat. They may not even want to eat dog meat. But given the choice between dying of malnutrition or eating meat from a dog, what would you choose? There's plenty of support from Chinese people and others around the world to ban the consumption of dog meat. However, the Chinese government has been slow to enact change that would stop people from eating dog. But change is coming, even if it is slow. Since the coronavirus outbreak, the Chinese government has put a temporary ban on all trade and consumption of wild animals. In this case, that includes dogs. There are currently talks within the Chinese government of making this ban permanent which would in effect end the rounding up and mass slaughter of dogs. Recently, the Agricultural Ministry of China has reclassified dogs as companion animals rather than livestock, as they were classified before. With the new classification and laws banning consumption of wild animals, dog meat should become illegal to eat in China by law. Although many activists believe this should have been done long ago, it's a step in the right direction. The Chinese people themselves have voiced concerns over the Yulin Dog Meat Festival and want to see it ended. They cite both animal welfare and food safety as the main concerns around the consumption of dog meat. The Chinese people have even taken to social media with hashtags including refuse to eat companion animals and cancel Yulin Dog Meat Festival, which have been trending on China's social media platform Weibo. On top of all the internal pressure by the Chinese citizens, activist groups from around the world have been trying to ban the Yulin Dog Meat Festival for years. The activist group Bo Ai Animal Protection Center in China's Sichuan province has been protesting to stop the festival for eight years. Each year, they go to the Public Complaints and Proposals Administration of Guangxi Province to petition the stop of the festival and for the government to put a ban on slaughtering pets. The Bo Ai Animal Protection Center, along with other international animal protection organizations such as No Dogs Left Behind, go to China and rescue dogs from being killed or sent to Yulin for the festival. The organization and their partners rescue dogs from illegal dog meat traders who have been stopped by the police. They then pair them with people looking to adopt the dog from other countries around the world. These organizations cannot rescue all of the dogs that are gathered to be killed and consumed, but they have saved hundreds of canine lives over the years. The Humane Society has supported grassroots campaigns in China to stop the Yulin Dog Meat Festival and have also raised awareness around the world of the atrocities that are occurring. Since their work began in 2010, the festival has slowly reduced in size, and there are more and more protests each year. In 2016, the Yulin police even erected a roadblock and checkpoints to stop trucks loaded with dogs from reaching the city. This was done a little late, and many trucks had already passed through. But having the local government and police making a tangible statement against the festival was a step in the right direction. In 2017, the Yulin government tried to impose a ban on the sale of all dog meat, but they succumbed to pressure from local dog traders who control a lot of money and power in the city. Instead of the ban, the government put restrictions on the number of dogs allowed to be sold in market stalls. They also made it illegal to make public displays of slaughtering the dogs. The government cracked down on the advertisement of dog meat being sold in restaurants as well. However, none of these restrictions helped combat the killing of dogs in back alleys or slaughterhouses just on the outskirts of the city. The dog meat trade is apparently so lucrative that people will find ways around the law just to participate in the Yulin Festival. Now, if you thought everything you heard so far is bad, wait until you get through this next part. The Guangxi Province, where Yulin is located, is in the top five worst affected areas for rabies in humans in China. 
This should come as no surprise at all, as the virus can be found in stray dogs. The rabies virus is incredibly deadly to all animals, including humans. If not treated before the onset of symptoms, it has one of the highest mortality rates of any virus on Earth at over 99%. This brings us to one of the biggest global problems of the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. The way that the dogs are treated and slaughtered is enough to make anyone condemn the festival. Due to the conditions in which the dogs are obtained, transported, and consumed, there's an even more important reason that this festival needs to be stopped, and it has to do with another global pandemic. COVID-19 has killed millions of people. We know that the virus jumped from another species to humans. Most scientists believe that this occurred in a live animal market, similar to the one that's held during the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. A video from the 2020 festival was taken showing vendors butchering the dogs without wearing face masks or any other form of protection. This is a recipe for disaster. It's been proven that the coronavirus cannot be spread from dogs to humans. However, that might not be true of a new virus in the future that could start the next global pandemic. This is why it's so vital to stop live animal markets that do not follow strict safety protocols. It's not just for the safety of the people in the market, but around the world as well. Change is slow. Dogs hold a special place in many people's hearts, which makes the thought of them being slaughtered and eaten unbearable to most of us. It's really important to remember that the vast majority of the Chinese people do not consume dog meat. It's also important to remember that the vast majority of Chinese people want to stop the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. The subset of people who are capturing and slaughtering thousands of dogs are not representative of the Chinese people as a whole, just like extremists in the country you live are not representative of you. The Yulin Dog Meat Festival should most definitely be put to a stop, for the dog's sake as well as us, for the safety of the entire world. Progress is being made, but since money and people's greeds are motivators for the festival, it'll be an uphill battle until the Chinese government bans the consumption of dog meat completely. The massive military and economic might of the People's Republic of China is constrained by the Gobi Desert to the north, Siberia and North Korea to the northeast, Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries to the south, and India and the Himalayas to the southwest and west. Only to the southeast toward the South China Sea does China have unfettered access to the rest of the world an access that it desperately needs for its economy to flourish. But even there, China is hampered by something called the First Island Chain. This is a chain that China wants to break through. Even if they were able to do that, they'd find themselves constrained by a different set of islands further away. But why is China so afraid of these islands? And where does the US come into the equation? In 1823, US President James Monroe invoked a concept later to be known as Manifest Destiny. In a speech presented to Congress in which he warned European nations, specifically Great Britain, France, and Spain, not to interfere with America's imminent westward expansion, Monroe pulled no punches as he unilaterally declared that any attempt by Europeans to colonize the American continents, as he described them, would be seen as potential acts of war. This dual policy of a God-given right to an American sphere of influence in North America, combined with a promise of non-intervention in European affairs, became known as the Monroe Doctrine. It wasn't until 1845 that the term Manifest Destiny would be coined almost simultaneously in two different printed publications. In the July-August 1845 issue of the Democratic Review, followed almost immediately in nearly an identical context in a July 1845 article, the New York Morning News. This term meant the inalienable course, some would argue their God-given right, to populate the areas west toward the Pacific Ocean. Following the U.S. Civil War, the Monroe Doctrine would be expanded to cover future U.S. intervention throughout Latin America and was even invoked by some politicians and diplomats to counter the Soviet Union's efforts to expand their influence into Latin America during the Cold War period from the 1950s through to the 1980s. This doctrine went hand in hand with the concept of manifest destiny and declared that both North and South America were the stomping grounds of the U.S. alone. The problem with the Manifest Destiny concept is that it completely crushed the rights of the indigenous Native Americans who already occupied those lands, as well as the Spanish settlers who had arrived centuries before the residents of the initial 13 colonies made it to mainland North America. In the words of the Cato Institute, the Monroe Doctrine, which instructed the Europeans to stay out of the Americas, was coldly and unashamedly self-interested. President Monroe laid out his position and that of future US presidents with a decidedly blinkered viewpoint. We should consider any attempt on their, Europe's part, to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. Monroe never mentioned how much peace and safety would be extended to the people already living in the areas that the US would eventually overrun. Today, China is facing its own moment of manifest destiny and are using many of the same self-serving arguments in order to push forward their own claims. 
they claim almost the entirety of the South China Sea as theirs, claiming that their trading ships back in the 16th century regularly went through these waters, which they then claim gives them exclusive rights to control the vast area. But recently they've gone even further to solidify their claims. China's Efforts to Conquer the South China Sea Throughout the South China Sea, China's military has occupied a number of barren atolls and even some underwater reefs and shoals and built them up to house air bases and military ports, literally dredging up sand and rock from the ocean floor to make these islands habitable. Seven of these bases are in an area west of the Philippines called the Spratly Islands, a 175,000 square mile area with more than 750 islands and reefs that combined barely total more than three square miles of actual above surface terrain. The Spratlys are such a widely spread out island chain that they're claimed in part by six different nations – China, the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Brunei. Most of the island chains are within the Philippines' 200-mile Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, while significant portions are also within the EEZs of Vietnam and Malaysia. Yet China has decided to position permanent military bases on these seven islands that were once partly or completely underwater. These island bases are part of a Chinese effort to occupy enough territory to defend a disputed interpretation of the South China Sea known as the Nine Dashed Line. This area, extending more than 800 miles from China's coast, is significant to China's economic future. Not only are vast fishing areas and untapped oil reserves in the area, something that all six nations are fighting over, but China's economic and national interests also demand they be able to control shipping through the area. Since the 1980s, more than half of the world's supertanker traffic by tonnage passes through the region's water every year. Tanker traffic through the South China Sea is over three times greater than through the Suez Canal and five times greater than through the Panama Canal. Up to one quarter of all the world's crude oil passes through the South China Sea on its way to China, which imports up to 70% of its oil and natural gas, as well as 65-70% to of its food for its massive population. China's also been threatening military action against the island of Taiwan, which Beijing claims is now and has always been a province of China. The Taiwanese, however, don't see it that way and have clung to their precarious freedom since their government retreated there following the Chinese Communist takeover of mainland China in 1949. Taiwan, ruled by the Republic of China or the ROC, as opposed to mainland China's government known as the People's Republic of China or PRC, represents a significant link in what's known in China as the First Island Chain, stretching from Japan to Taiwan and then south to include portions of the Philippines and further south to Indonesia. This area is perceived by China with the same manifest destiny-tinted glasses as theirs by ordained right, just as the US previously saw all the land between the Mississippi and the West Coast as ultimately theirs to conquer and control. But despite all the Chinese military bluster surrounding Taiwan and beyond their efforts to occupy and conquer, there is another set of islands in the East that pose a bigger threat to China's economic future. They contain no Chinese bases, no military buildup, no ancient historical pretext of ownership, in fact nothing for which China can lay claim to, the way that they've tried to claim so much of the South China Sea. And yet, these few islands perhaps remain more of a threat to China's future than Taiwan and the Spratlys combined, and few people in the West have ever heard their names. The Worst Kept Secret Between China and the West they're called the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, a mostly north-to-south oriented archipelago of around 572 islands on the very eastern edge of the Bay of Bengal. They lie only 22 nautical miles from Myanmar, also known as Burma, to the north and 99 miles from Indonesia to the south. They've been considered part of India for centuries, at least since 800 AD, when the Kola dynasty had influence over the islands during their 400-year rule. When Great Britain subjugated India from the late 1850s through to 1947, England used these islands as a convenient penal colony. When India gained its independence after World War II, England wanted to retain ownership of the islands, but India persuaded them that the islands had been an integral part of India economically for more than two millennia and were necessary for India's defense of the Bay of Bengal and the greater Indian Ocean to their immediate west. What makes these sparsely populated islands so important to both India and China are their location. The archipelago sits strategically at the entrance of the Malacca Strait, the world's busiest shipping route. In a time of crisis, India would be able to blockade the Straits of Malacca, the Lombok Strait or the Sunda Strait using elements of the Indian Navy based out of Port Blair in conjunction with the navies of Indonesia, Vietnam and other Asian nations. Just as China is doing with the seven islands of the Spratly Islands, India has decided that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands archipelago would make excellent positions not just for naval support and resupply, but also as unsinkable aircraft carriers. 
They also have the capability to support radar installations that with tall enough towers can see over the horizon farther than any ship-based radar system. Relations have steadily deteriorated between India and China since a series of violent border clashes in the disputed region in the Himalayas erupted in 1957 and grew worse in 2020. Both sides want to maintain control of the vital deepwater narrows that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands protect. Military Improvements on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands Aware of the future role that the area can have in keeping an eye on China's naval force projection, India has taken steps to build up the infrastructure on the archipelago. India's Andaman and Nicobar Command ANC, established in 2001, is the only tri-service theater command, integrating air, naval, and army forces of the Indian Armed Forces. Based at Port Blair near the southern tip of the Andaman Islands Group, the command was created to oversee and coordinate India's strategic interests in the nearby Strait of Malacca to the east and the South China Sea beyond. This base allows for rapid deployment of military assets in the event of hostilities anticipated to come primarily from China. The base provides logistical and administrative support to naval ships which are sent on deployment to East Asia and the Pacific Ocean. The Andaman and Nicobar Command includes INS Jarawa, a modern naval base of the Indian Armed Forces located in Port Blair at the southern tip of South Andaman, which is the territory's only populated town. The base was commissioned in 1964 and has undergone recent upgrades and improvements. INS Utkrosh is the adjacent naval air station, which is concerned with operating defense and reconnaissance craft for the region, while INHS Don Vantari serves as a naval hospital for the base. Port Blair also has the services of Floating Dock Navy FDN-1 of nearly 40,000 tons, large enough to service all but the biggest ships in the Indian Navy, while a second smaller floating dock FDN-2 was ordered in 2010. Port Blair is a two to three hour flight from mainland India via Port Blair's Veer Savarkar International Airport and three to four days by sea to reach the eastern coastal cities of India. China's Regional Response The Andaman and Nicobar Islands aren't the only islands in the area that have seen an increase in military attention. Just off the southwest coast of Myanmar lies Great Coco Island, a small remote island only eight miles long. It's also just 45 miles north of the northern sections of the Andaman Islands. Great Coco Island, the largest part of the Coco Islands chain, has been allegedly leased to the People's Republic of China since 1994, though China calls such a claim laughable. Despite the island's tiny size and China's protestations to the contrary, it's nevertheless big enough for someone to clandestinely build a brand new 7,500-foot runway. Signs of construction have provoked concern that China, to which the military junta of Myanmar has grown increasingly dependent on following their February 2021 coup, would use the location to gather intelligence on the Indian Navy either through espionage or via a constellation of radar dishes placed there similar to the buildup on their seven contested Spratly Island bases. And as with China's militarization in the Spratlys, there are fears that a larger military presence will follow, using the newly installed runway and port facilities as a wedge in the door to a greater military presence needed to protect those facilities. Greater Coco Island and the seven Spratly bases aren't the only places where China is positioning its military to control the high seas. They've also begun building up a naval station in Cambodia at a location called Reem Base in the Gulf of Thailand, close to the strategically important Malacca Strait. As with Great Coco Island, China denies they're building a naval facility there, but real-time geospatial satellite surveillance is now available to refute those denials. Black Sky, a US-based persistent global monitoring service, a private satellite company not unlike SpaceX's Starlink, though on a much more specialized scale, has been able to gather intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance or ISR data on Reem Base, proving that China is building up the location with a big investment in men and material. As with the Spratlys, Reem Base will be able to support large naval vessels with additional structures still in the building phase. Interestingly, the satellite images show two piers under construction, the longest of which extends more than 2,200 feet in length, with almost 1,000 feet of usable docking space. This one pier is being developed with a distinctive angled shape, a feature not seen at every staging area, but present at China's only other major naval base in foreign waters on the coast of the African city of Djibouti. The Djibouti base was the first China built away from the South China Sea. Its construction began in 2016, during which time China protested that it wasn't building anything militarily connected there. By 2022, there were 2,000 permanent Chinese military personnel there, and their angled dock, identical to the one being built in Cambodia at its new Reem base, is deemed large enough to handle one of China's three new aircraft carriers. As with the seven island bases in the South China Sea, China first claimed its base in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa was going to be a civilian project and denied any implication that it was going to be militarized, 
Djibouti is strategically situated by the Bab el Mandeb Strait, which separates the Gulf of Aden from the Red Sea and oversees the southern approaches to the Suez Canal. The location is significant not just to China. The U.S. operates its own base, Camp Lemonnier, just to the south, along with the French who have their own base Ariane 188, primarily for the French Air Force, while Japan maintains a self-defense force base Djibouti right next door. The beginning of the construction of this base in 2016 and its implications for further militarization of the region by China prompted the African-based Peace Security Council, or PSC, to issue a warning about allowing future foreign military bases in their countries. The council urged member countries to be cautious when entering into agreements that would lead to the establishment of foreign military bases in their country. Despite these concerns, the African continent has become a host to an increasing number of foreign military bases and logistics hubs, primarily as a direct result of trade and economic agreements between a few African Union member states and China, China's massive Belt and Road Initiative. Along with these major military bases, bases which, remember, China has always claimed weren't for military purposes until they were completed and then, whoops, they really are military bases. China is also involved in hundreds of smaller projects throughout Asia and Africa. The Belt and Road Initiative, launched by Chinese President Xi Jinping during a visit to Kazakhstan and Indonesia in 2013, was initially a two-pronged program, the Overland Silk Road Economic Belt and the Maritime Silk Road. The two complementary sections were originally referred to as the One Belt, One Road Initiative, but eventually became the Belt and Road Initiative, known as the BRI. The BRI is a multi-billion dollar program that funnels Chinese building projects into agreeable countries. Everything from railroads and highways to complete ports and airports are built, which are then taken over by the Chinese government when the poorer countries inevitably can't repay their building loans. If this sounds suspiciously like a crime syndicate taking over a business because they can't pay a loan shark, that's because it is exactly like that. The program is currently the primary method with which China is increasing its presence around the world. In the bigger picture, this is China's global plan both for projecting power into new regions, primarily Central Asia and Africa, while also working to ensure unfettered access to the countries where it seeks raw materials. The initiative oversees a funding pool as large as $67.8 billion in 2022, which was a slight decrease from 2021. The amount funds over 200 separate projects in 147 countries, many of which are currently losing money. These losses may send several of the host countries into bankruptcy. One example is Pakistan, whose indebtedness is currently at $62 billion, of which 80% has been financed by China. This indebtedness is fueled in part by the high cost of the BRI projects combined with the high rate of interest China is charging. And here is where Djibouti returns to the picture. The 2018 International Monetary Fund assessment pointed out that the building program they had agreed to with China increased external debt for the country from 50% of GDP to 85%, the highest of any low-income country. Much of this debt is owed to China's Exim Bank and consists of a government-guaranteed public enterprise debt for things like the new Chinese-built port. If Djibouti defaults on its debt, the contracts put in place allow China to assume ownership of the facilities. Many other BRI countries have identical clauses in their own contracts. It's not just Africa and Andaman and Nicobar Islands, though. There are worries about other small island chains seeing an undue military influence as China and India vie for regional positioning. The Maldives, a small, strategically located archipelagic nation in the southwestern Indian Ocean, lies only 370 miles from India's nearest coastline. The island nation is embroiled in a diplomatic tug-of-war between the two Asian powerhouses. While India has been conducting military exercise with the Maldives' tiny 2,500-man military, China has made its desire known to place military bases there, which India has naturally responded negatively to. The problem is that the Maldives, like many other Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean island chains, is an archipelago of low-lying islands, reefs, and atolls. According to World Bank, with the future sea levels projected to increase in the range of 10 to 100 centimeters by the year 2100, the entire country could be submerged. But as we've seen with China's creation of artificial islands, that's no deterrent to a sufficiently motivated military with deep enough pockets and sufficient dredging machinery. Despite its relatively small above-water footprint and the threat of global sea level rise, the Maldives become the latest location where both China and India want military control. In 2013, the island saw the rise of the authoritarian Abdul Yamin, who agreed to a series of infrastructure projects as part of China's budding BRI program. By 2018, Beijing had completed a major upgrade of the Maldives' main international airport, including, as we've seen before, a new 11,000-foot runway. 
long enough to handle the biggest of China's bomber fleet. These improvements have come at a high cost for the Maldives. China's loans have saddled the country with nearly $1.5 billion in debt, a high figure for a nation with a GDP of less than $9 billion. More recently, India has stepped in and allocated up to $1.4 billion to help pay off the country's debt. This is a similar tactic to Japan's grant of $3.4 billion to India to help them build the necessary energy grid to keep the Andaman and Nicobar Islands fully functioning. Japan sees a strong Indian presence in these islands as a vital means of reining in China's growing presence in the region. This program, launched in 2021, is expected to be completed by early 2024. India's Naval Partners the need for Japan to help India fund its control over the islands highlights what some analysts see as an underfunded state of a vital choke point. These analysts perceive that India has neglected the necessary infrastructure for the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, in part because of their 800-mile distance from the mainland. India's land-based forces have been prioritized after the serious clashes along its borders with China. Funding for the Navy was focused on strengthening India's immediate coastline defense, while the island's potential was something that would have been taken care of in the indeterminate future. However, just as Taiwan won't have to go it alone against all of China's expanding Navy, India has partners on its side as well. The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or QUAD for short, is a military partnership sometimes dubbed the Asian NATO. It's made up of the four countries of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. The Quad's inception began with the CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, which really was originally thought of as an Asian NATO by its organizers. In that respect, it was planned to be a strictly defensive organization. Where NATO was created to unify defense against Soviet Russia's expansionist aims, CETO was similarly created to coordinate a united defense against perceived Chinese aggression. Following the massively destructive 2004 tsunami that ravaged many Indian Ocean countries, the U.S. set up a working group of nations to coordinate disaster relief to the hardest-hit areas, including India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. This core group that would oversee relief efforts included India, Australia, Japan, and, of course, the U.S. The Quad members reiterated support for the principles that underlie a previous regional group known as ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Their principles for free trade and unfettered access to the world's oceans, as well as mutual economic and diplomatic ties, were more easily implemented by those four major economic powers. Their leadership would strengthen engagement with other ASEAN organized efforts, including the ASEAN Regional Forum and the annual East Asia Summit. Just as the U.S. would not be denied its vision of manifest destiny, there is every reason to believe that China will continue to operate in the same way. The U.S. had a problem early in its history that China does not currently have. That is, when President Monroe foresaw the continent fully under American sway, he didn't have the military might to back it up. However, China has a growing and modernizing army and navy, with a nuclear missile stockpile that's increasing almost as fast. While other countries like Japan, Australia, and India are trying to keep pace, China has gained economic and diplomatic partners in their race to build military bases in many far-off locations, including Africa, Central Asia, and potentially even South America. China has already spent more than a billion dollars on their Belt and Road Initiative, which is designed to link together many of the countries that they'll need to supply them with the raw materials their country will need well into the rest of the 21st century. If India wants to put a collar on this new dragon, then the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will be one significant part of that collar. But they won't be able to stand up by themselves against the massive military might that China possesses. They'll need the assistance of its regional allies, especially the three other members of the Quad, Japan, Australia, and of course the United States. Now you need to watch Russia and China versus NATO, or watch this video instead.